that's a memory operation we could dodge potentially. Um, RDX uh, LEA R14 RDI plus five. That's updating the pointer. This is checking if CL. That's kind of strange. That's like on the inside of the source shift. That's our 43. Why would something be using a value from here, from the second shift? Test CL. Um, oh, does it know that that's going to be unaffected? Oh, it knows that that bit is unaffected, so it can use an earlier version of that bit. That's pretty impressive. Um, then we set up the args and we perform a call. Uh, I think our use of a calling convention is really going to hurt us. I think th the population of these for a call, um, that's going to hurt a lot. Uh, these are pretty solid here. Um, it does look like jump tables are getting emit. Uh, we've got a bounds check on the jump table. Okay, that's on the A case. Oh, shit. So it does one, and then it does a switch. Okay, so that tried to get it into a range that was easier to compute. Then we have the switch. Um, once again, a lot of instructions here due to indications. Um, uh Uh, 3C into there, BP into there. Our Zor shift is definitely hurting us. Um, yeah, that's definitely hurting us. Um, there's Nopstad, not padding is fine there more Zor shift. It's causing a lot of code uh, size increase, which is hurting uh, instruction cache. Um, let's see. These are good. These moves add five. So it there it wrote a byte. Here it wrote four more bytes, added five. We generate a new random number. Once again, we're kind of reading and writing from the from self. Uh, pretty frequently there and then the construction of these calls is way too big and then the register uh, homing uh, basically by having a calling convention like this uh, we're actually losing a lot of performance um, I think there's a good chance that um, in whistle this might be a lot faster um, and that sounds stupid, but the calling convention on Linux, I think, is friendlier to these sorts of things. So we're going to see what we get. Um, that calling convention, setting up those args is, is definitely hurting us. Uh, popping stack at the end. Now, that being said, we're doing a lot more in these since things got inlined. So I don't know. Like a call to here, like this function is going to do a lot of stuff before the overhead matters. Um, here's a, here's a panic. Compare RCX2, panic. Uh, that's unimplemented here. This is going to be the, like, um, internal error. Uh, oops. Unreachable code. Um. Okay. That kind of hurts. Uh, test. Yeah, this is just slightly faster. The calling convention is just a little bit friendlier, but um, I don't know. I think I'm pretty happy with kind of wrapping it up here. Um, yeah, it, it looks like their paper is pretty close to what, um, what things max out at. I can't test on their specific processor. Uh, I'm within like a factor of two. At, uh, on this one, I'm like four times faster, but on everything else, it's like a factor of two. Um, which is totally fine. It's like a, a factor of two on that. Um, that's totally within reason for differences between the processor and differences between um, like 
differences between the processor clock rate that I have and the microarchitecture that they have, which is one generation older than my microarchitecture. Um, I think it's likely that what I have what I have here is not exactly what they're doing. Um, so it's not a hundred percent fair. I would say if I added the like, I mean it's really just a lookup in a table to figure out what it would resolve to. Um, so I don't think there's a huge amount that I'm losing there. Um, I think the RNG, there's probably room for improvement. If I did the like byte consuming thing that they had, um, that would probably give a slight speed up if I did that. Um, I think mine is probably within a factor of four of what is possible with like a JIT, with like a high performance um, assembler that's designed for this with a calling convention where like things these aren't reading and writing memory every operation uh the branches are getting much less used things are getting inlined at a higher frequency um so um i don't know the rng might be the biggest bottleneck at this point uh i can uh say inline never on that and i i can see if this really hurts perf then there's a good chance that that is our bottleneck. Um, but there's probably a good chance that that's not the case. I don't know. Uh, test. Yeah, so that hurt performance by a pretty small amount. So I don't think our RNG is our bottleneck. I think our bottleneck is probably branches. Um, and yeah. And if our bottleneck is branches, then that's probably pretty close to what we could get. Um, I don't know. I, th I think their paper is a really cool concept. Um, I think they made it kind of overcomplicated. Um, I don't like that they allocated max int on a global. Uh, I don't like that they're using globals. Um, but... I mean, there's a, I guess these inputs look like kind of small. I don't know how big the inputs they're generating are. Maybe they're generating a lot more. Although, um, I'm also doing uniform random between all these things. Um, uh, we can see what they do in theirs. Um, fuzzer.py. I don't think they should have gone to assembly. I, I think that's just hurting them. Um, it makes it much harder to work with, much harder to tweak. Now, assembly probably will give you an advantage at some point. At some point, there probably is an advantage to doing that. Um... So, rand. Um, I guess it's uh, random here. Okay. Sorrel. Good. We made some improvements. We made like a couple, like 5 or 10% improvements to their code generation. I know that they, if they reduced the amount of calls they had, um, things would probably look a lot better. Um, the, the fact that they have calls that go to, um, uh, like single instructions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, th you could get like a 20 X speed up on that. So I don't know, maybe looking at, at generating the assembly, how big are the inputs? I think their inputs are, are pretty reasonable sized. Um, LSL IO.X. Yeah. Um, Average.py uh, performed that runs that cycles per uh, cycles per byte. Okay, yeah. So we have a cycles per byte number, um, and I can go compute that for mine. And then we r then we're actually comparing apples to apples, just in case their perf numbers are are different than ours. Uh, we're gonna use JSON.JSON. Um, what is the depth that I'm using in this uh, uh, average.py? Uh, depth is 32. So we'll set my depth to 32. Uh, it is. Okay. And we switch to json.json. Okay. 
So actually, these outputs don't look great. Depth is equal to that. If we hit that depth cap, we return up without generating something. I wonder if everything's kind of, um, we actually might get a perf speed up if we, if we resolve to um, something. So, uh, cause this doesn't look, these don't look very uh, full, right? These look very empty. Um, and I think that's hurting us a lot. I think we might be outperforming them. Let's, uh, let's try and get at parity here. Um, let's try to see that's 32 depth. Um, and we're stopping at 32 depth. If I go to like 128 depth, I start to see like the massive explosion stuff. I think, um, will I see a lot more bites is, is my question here. No. And I'm curious if if I hit this depth, does that cause me to like unwind all the way back and end up kind of doing nothing? Um, maybe their depth is different than my depth. Because uh, these inputs look way too small. Um, I'm going to turn up the reporting rate. Um, yeah, these inputs just look kind of small. Uh, compared to with theirs, uh, cat io.x. Uh, these are a lot larger, cat io.x. So I'm not quite sure how our algorithms differ. Um, let me get rid of optimize just in case. Just in case optimize is hurting us. We actually don't really need optimize anymore because the Rust compiler will just handle it for us. Um, actually, did that... Did that slow us down? 47 a second. This is 70 a second. Okay, optimize did help. Um, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, because, yeah, Rust probably doesn't optimize to that level. Okay. If depth is 32, then I'm going to do... If depth is uh, greater than or equal to 32, what I want to do is I want to... Uh, I want to update, we're going to do this. Um, it's basically going to be the same code from terminal here. Uh, this. So we'll say r this. Um, tab this all over. And then I'm going to say, oops. Uh, program plus equals, create the values. If depth is greater than or equal to 32, then we're going to do this. And in this case, value. Um, I'm just going to whack an A in here. So offset plus 1. Uh, and then return offset plus 1. So if the depth is greater than that, then we're going to fill in a 1, and then we're going to write a copy from slice ox41. So we're going to write an A. And I want to see if we'd, we're going to see a lot of A's. And it's possible that uh, basically anywhere we see A's spammed, we probably should see a lot more data. Um, so if I were to... That's 78 megs a second. Um, hmm. Copy from slice. I'm not seeing as many A's as I expected. I don't know how they're producing much larger inputs than I am. Um... Like, their inputs are much bigger. Um, so if I look at F1, fuzzer, input fragments. Oh, they call them fragments, too. Okay. Um, that's their RNG. That looks good. Initialize the RNG. Um, module reduction. Yep. 
This code is actually pretty hard to read because there's just so much of the like strings in here. Is key recursive? Compute rule recursion. Use for escaping. Not sure what is bad. Okay, that's the Python compiled one, the pooled fuzzer. Two key. Okay, split tokens, translate. Um, so I'm interested, maybe I can look at just the uh, generated output that they use. So here we're going to get a seed, a max num. So max num for up to max num. Oh, so max num is the number of generations they perform in one swoop. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we change this, this is the, the number to produce. And then this will give us a better example. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, shit. Um, io.x is 2, 2. Uh, LSL io.x. Uh, 2066. Uh, what? One. Um, oh. Uh, I need to remove io.x. I think that's the issue. Average.py. Um, OS.remove. io.x. If os.path.exists, io.x. Whoa. Uh, oh, do I have it not writing anymore? No, I do. Uh, where's io.x? Why is it not creating that? It's not even max num, max depth. The number in here. What is gen init? Oh, that actually does it. And then it puts a new line, updates the cursor. Um, ls lslio.x so if i do one does it not work ah okay there we go seven bytes false yep uh average.py okay so yeah the perf kind of goes to shit in that case uh, not too surprised. Um, so I want to make a change to F1 fuzzer, um, RDTSC. So down here, I want to get rid of the F right because that's not fair. It's really, it's not fair at all. Uh, bytes written is going to be equal to out cursor, I think. Um, I think. Out cursor. We'll, we'll see. Um, and let me uh, go into there again. Out cursor, uh, RDTSC, um, this, and then I'll print uh, percent LU of the 
be written. Uh, Python uh, make seven 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 is it deterministic now? Wait, what? Is it because of the multiple inputs before? Because we're always getting the same size. Um, if, they're, if their benchmarks aren't actually randomly, gener randomly using a different seed, um, then uh, RDTSC, out cursor. Out cursor is equal to that, which is out region P minus the init region P, and it gets the difference, the out cursor. Um, F right, it's that many bytes. So that is how many bytes were generated. And now we're being fair because we're no longer uh, performing an F right, and we're not even including the time it takes for them to generate random numbers. Um, but now is it always the same? Yeah, now it's six. Oh no, if they're benchmarking, if they're benchmarking using the ran the same seed every time, um, that's really not fair. Um, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, we'll do percent d mod random dot rand int zero uh, to, uh, I don't know, 10,000. I think they probably have that many seeds. Python average.py. Okay. And I just want to print this output. I want to see if we're getting different values. We are. We're getting different sizes. Um, okay. So then this is this is basically what I'm doing. Um, and it's on the exact same hardware. So I'm using their engine. And this is my engine here. The outputs are very similar. In fact, I can put some prints in there um, if you want to see. Oh, I don't have i.x. Um, I could have it printed out, actually. Um, if I do uh, print output and then vim f1 uh, fuzzer, we're going to go into here and I'll print the output. Uh, this is going to be out region in it p um, and then out uh, out region in it p at out cursor is equal to zero so we'll null terminate it and we'll just print that out as a string so we're seeing what it's producing and you get like true some tabbed in white space um, and it looks pretty comparable to ours if we run it on the side So uh, I guess I'm putting in the A's in there, um, which I don't need anymore. We'll get rid of that temporarily. Oops. Um, that's where we want to be. Okay. So I think the output is pretty similar. Um, lots of things that are just true. Uh, yeah, I think they're pretty comparable. Like some things have some like more structure to them. A lot of things don't. A lot of them are empty strings. Sometimes you just get like garbage. Uh, sometimes you just get like an empty null or a true. Those seem to be pretty common. Um, I think that lines up pretty close to uh, what I'm producing. So they're taking 600 bytes per cycle. And we're going to see what our uh, per cycle um, performance is. So uh, we'll do let it cycle is equal to unsafe uh, standard uh, uh, arch x86 64 uh, rdtsc uh, double curlies and then here I'm going to get elapsed cycle is equal to rdtsc minus it cycle and then what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the print of the data and I'm going to print the uh, cycles per byte and uh, yeah 12, 12 uh, 
12.6 for this one. Um, and here we'll do elapsed cycle as F64 divided by uh, generated as F64. So that's the same benchmark that I'm using on theirs. Um, let's see, everything builds, looks good. Okay, so they're getting about 599. Uh, I'm getting 37. Um, in fact, yeah. Yeah. That would put mine at, uh, that would put mine at 16 times faster. And the output looks very similar. Uh, uh, maximum is one. Picking a different random each time. Um, So I can I can I can give them a little bit more space by like having them do a thousand inputs. Um, whoa. Uh, I think this is now wrong. Out cursor, out region P, out region init P. Um, uh, out region init P. Okay. Okay, so that is a global, and then the out region pointer, and out cursors out region P. That's passed to here, so that's gonna update that. It puts a new line in there. Um, and I do elapsed in cycles divided by the number of bytes written. Um, whoa, ever so high. If I do 10, like that's just slowing down. Why is that not F right out region and nit P there to FS? What is Out reason init p out cursor. Why is that so small? Why is that nine bytes for those? Because it's doing up to max num. Um, huh. Uh, printf max num is percent d max num. Maybe I didn't make? I thought I called make. Okay. Average dot pi. Why is that, if I do a hundred or 10 here, make. 100. Uh, did I break something? Because this is producing very few bytes now. F1 fuzzer, RDTSC max num. Uh, printf max num is percent d max num. I just want to see. Uh, yep, terminating quote. What? Um, missing terminating quote. Oh, yep, new lines again. Okay, so max num is that. Max num is 100. Okay. Out region p, out region init p. 
Oh, cause it's oh I see. It's not it's not a pending because it resets it each case. So we're just gonna do this. There we go. Okay, that's better. So that's gonna generate a hundred inputs. Uh, average up high. There we go. So that's now down to um. Yeah, that's more fair. Uh, Python average dot pi. Now it's down to ninety. Let's uh. Average dot pi. Let's set this to like a thousand. We'll let it generate a thousand inputs in its internal loop. Um, and now I need to get rid of that print. Oops. Okay, thirty-five. All right. So it's about the same. Um. Okay. That's kind of what I would expect. So, 35. Yeah, it looks about the same. Looks like I'm a smidge slower. Um, although I'm not doing... I'm not doing the... Uh, um, let's see. If I were to do bulk inputs, would that save time? Would that save perf? I don't know. This is kind of not fair. Um, I'd say they're about the same. Okay. That's a pretty good conclusion. Uh, the, the performance looks pretty solid on this then. Um, I wouldn't omit to assembly. Um, I think that's just, I think that's just hurting. Um, but it's also... It's kind of not fair to compare these two. Um, so that's going to, yeah, that's outputting to the buffer, just going through it. Um, out region P, we're printing that off. Uh, we get the elapse well before we actually do anything. Um, main loop. I think the biggest thing is their random initialization. Um, All right, let's put this inside of here. We're gonna now initialize the random numbers inside of the um, inside of the time. So we're gonna count the uh, time it takes to initialize those random numbers as part of the process. Um, huh? Okay, that didn't have really any effect. Uh, oh, did I do that in the wrong place? I think I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, I need to do that in F1 fuzzer. Uh, we're gonna grab the uh, initialize random. I think it's this main rand frag. Okay. RDTSC. We're going to put these down here. We're going to see how this looks. Okay. So now it's about comparable. Um, just a smidge slower, uh, but they're probably over generating random numbers that they're not necessarily using. I actually don't know what happens in their code base um, if you uh, fuzzer.py, uh, wherever the random buffer is, the global, wherever that is, initialize random, uh, random region size. What happens if this is smaller? Does it even check if it runs out of entropy? Um, oh, I think the cursor like resets around. Uh, okay, so let's go to like 24. I'd expect that to be much slower now. Bim main dot k here initialize random rain re uh that is gonna go through get the array. It's gonna initialize this for max chars. Uh
Range region size. Oh, I modified the wrong one. Okay. Uh, Rand region size. Apparently, there's another defined somewhere here. If I did like 24, this is probably not fair because now it's generating a lot of random numbers. Yep, that's a lot slower. Um, if I did 8, um, Sixteen, it was kind of running out of random numbers, so that wasn't. I'm gonna say twenty-eight. What's that? What's two to the twenty-eight? I don't want them to run out of random numbers during their uh, uh, fuzz, during their iteration, because I don't think that's fair. Um, yeah, that's obviously not fair. I'm gonna move the uh, uh, initialize random. I'm gonna move this call out of here, I'm going to get rid of that. Um, okay. Yeah. That seems about right. Okay. So, it's about the same. Um, actually, I might be printing too much there. I don't think, I don't think that's having an effect at this point. Uh, I could also try it on the Linux side of things. Okay, yeah, that did drop it down. Yeah, they're they're pretty much identical um, when it comes to perf. Um, yeah, they they actually are 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 pretty much the same uh, when it comes to perf. Um, I I still think there's a lot of room for improvement on theirs. Um, let me see. Why did I not have xperf? I. Uh, or um, VS Perf. Where is that? Uh, that's the performance toolkit. Uh, VS Perf. Uh, uh, Windows Perf toolkit. Grab the performance toolkit. Um. Is it in the assessment and deployment kit? Okay. 80K. Oh, I probably didn't install the right features uh, when I installed this way back when. Yep. Ah. Uh, I have VTune. I can try VTune. VTune should do the trick here. It's probably better than VS Perf, actually, when it comes down to it. And all I need to do is test out exe, right? Yeah. So we're going to go and uh, create a new project uh, test, blah, blah, blah. We're going to launch an application. We're going to point it to uh, dev, uh, maybe, maybe fastest fuzzer test, uh, application parameters none, use the same working directory. Uh, hardware based. Okay, let's go. It's doing its thing. Kill it. Let's get that processed. And the PDB should be there. So let's see. We'll see where our uh, CPU time is spent. Okay. Parallelism. Yeah. Not any. Uh, but that's fine. Okay. So, what do we got here? Um, instructions retired. Pretty much all of our time is spent in one function. Um, that's actually kind of what I expected, is that there's probably a 5x in there. Now, I don't know if this is based on multi-core. I don't think so. Code efficiency on this platform is very low. Um, and I, I think that's the case because the, the frequency of the calls kind of really hurts the performance of that fuzzer. So let's take a look at, lo like we're spending a lot of CPU time in a call, uh, spend a lot of time on compares and a lot of branches. In fact, what is this doing? 
um, what is this doing? Where is this at? Um, so our RNG, uh, kind of expensive here. And these compares are, are killing me. So blocks, these are getting dispatched. Okay, so I'm doing a compare against 1D. Is that 32? Uh, that is. These are the comparisons on the depth. Just comparing on those depths is really hurting performance. Um, pretty bad. Uh, let's see. I don't really want platform. Summary. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cycles per instruction. That's really bad. Cycles per instruction of 1.2 is really bad. That should be that should be like four. Um. Or it it should be like 0.25. Um, branch mesh prediction. Okay, I think. Okay, let's see what we can do here. There we go. Let's try this out. Do, do, do. This is going to give us some like microarchitecture information. Um, it's going to be bad. I, I do think this is like 5x slower than what is theoretically possible. Um, okay, here we go. Wow. Wow. Wow, that is really bad. So front end bound, that's not too bad. Uh, retiring, that's uh, that's kind of fine. Core bound, so this is non-memory issues. So we're bottlenecking on memory. We're bottlenecking on uh, uh, core utilization. And our speculation is crushing us. Um, Wow. Uh, retiring percentage of pipeline slots. Okay. Uh, general retirement. Uh, other good. Uh, there's not much we can do on the that end of things. The front end I think is fine. There's not front latency. That looks good. Branch re-steers. Mm. Mispredict re-steers 9%. Uh, front end bandwidth, um, front end bandwidth DSB. So actually by doing the random number generator that they have where it's in memory, they're probably actually getting a lot due to uh, getting rid of speculation. Cause I think the speculation, it'll be able to look ahead on the byte that it's using for the random number generation. And it will probably not have the speculation issues that we have here. This is really bad. This, this is basically saying that we could get a 2x if we improve speculation. Um, back end bound, 27.6. Uh, uh, memory bound, a uh, lot on the L1. DRAM, hitting nothing on DRAM. Uh, we just got some issues on L1. Um, we got no split loads, that's pretty good. How often the machine was stalled uh, without missing the L1 data cache. Um, how often the machine was stalled without missing L1 data cache. So this is blocking on L1 memory accesses. 12% um, of clock ticks, okay. So 12% of clock ticks, we were bottlenecking on waiting for memory to be uh, uh, read or written. Um, store bound, uh, store latency. So spending a little bit of time on long latency store misses. Missing the second level cache uh, huh, am I resetting that pointer? I think I, I probably am. Uh, blah, blah, blah here. I am, yeah, I'm always resetting that pointer. Okay. Uh, back inbound, uh, okay, so bad speculation, branch mis mispredictions. That's pretty catastrophic. In, in this case, the L1, 
I don't know if there's much that we can do to avoid memory accesses. Um, I do like this diagram. That's kind of new. They just added that, or probably within the past like two years. Uh, port utilization, port zero. Um, this is the fraction of cycles no UOPs executed by the CPU on any execution port. Long latency instructions like divides may contribute to this metric. Um, wow. Cycles of three plus ports utilized. So this is good. Uh, so this is basically saying 22% of the time we weren't even using a, a, a port at all. And that's likely due to bad speculation. Um, we're actually throwing away a lot. This bad speculation is probably much worse. Um, this CPI rate is really bad. Um, yeah, maybe having that pre-generated RNG would it help. I'd have to go by like uh, unsafe access of that to get it. Um, let's do like, let's do like RNG vec new. Um, actually, I don't want to do a vector. I want it fixed size. We're gonna go fixed size on these. Um, and yeah, so we're gonna do this is equal to a um a box slice. Uh, of bytes, and we'll say, we'll say six, uh, 64K. We're gonna allocate room on the RNG, um, vec new, uh, zero, 10, thousand, dot into, uh, box slice. Actually, I think I just need to do box. I've, might not have enough stack space to do that. Ah, that might be fine. Oh, it's 4 one bats. Okay. That shouldn't really affect perf because it's not doing anything yet. Uh, box syntax. That's still experimental. Are you kidding me? Uh, I guess we need to do that in the, in the program we're generating. So here we'll do, uh, Feature box syntax. Oh, I guess I, yeah. I can do box new. Man. We need box syntax. Okay. And now we're going to do RNG pointer is zero. RNG pointer is equal to a cell of a U16. And the compiler should be smart enough to know that's always in bounds. So here we're going to do uh, rand um, internal, r yeah, rand internal. It's going to get a U8, which is what they're doing. And we'll do, uh, we'll do RNG, we'll do self.rng, self.rng pointer dot get. And then we'll do, um, that's the r return value. And then we'll do self.rngpointer.set, self.rngpointer.get, dot wrapping, add one. Rets. Okay, rand int. So that's just going to loop around, but it's always in bounds. So that should be fine. Um, let's see. Rand int. Okay, cell. And at 57, that needs to be a U size. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. On this 57. Shoop. So this needs to be as a U size. This is not going to be realistic because we're not doing any RAND yet. Uh, but that looks good. Cycles per byte, 8. Um, and VTune would probably be a lot happier. So if I were to run this again, uh, run this, see what happens. 
Okay, let's see what it complains about. Yeah, I think preventing 100% core bound. Uh, yeah, there's a CPI rate at like the 0.3 level, which is good. Um, so now I just have to fill that with random data because uh, we don't do that yet. So I'm going to do um, four, uh, we'll do uh, fuzzer.rng.intermute uh, dot for each mute x. I don't know if I do iter mute or just iter. I think it might just do, yeah, and then I don't, I just do for each times x is equal to fuzzer dot rand as you wait. Okay. Uh, 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 do I have to put these in cells? Then this will get, go to a dot get. And then this can be an iter for each x dot set that. Oh, yep. Cell so new. I really hope that implements copy. No, it doesn't. Son of a bitch. All right, we'll try box syntax. Uh, feature box syntax, see what that does. Um, and just this, I think, is the correct syntax. What? Did they get rid of the box syntax? Yeah, maybe. Box new. Um, can I try into a fixed sized? Can I do that? Can I do a um, uh, let mute uh, RNG is equal to vec of a cell that implements clone, so that's fine. OX that. Let's slice, uh, we don't need it to be mute. Sliced is gonna be a box of U8, which is close, equals RNG dot um, uh, from uh, dot to box slice, into box slice, can't remember, um, into box slice. Okay, and uh, yeah, sell. Uh, copy is not implemented for that, of course not. Let's see if this performance is fine. And I'm not sure. Yep, that's atrocious. And here, if I do a uh, dot try into, I don't know if they support this. Uh, we'll bring this in. I don't think they support this. Um, dot unwrap. Please, 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 damn it. Try from not implemented for that. Um, All right, we got to do some unsafe uh, OX1000. Uh, what we're going to do is as pointer. Um, and we'll do unsafe. Uh, yep. We'll do box from raw. And then standard mem forget RNG. Uh, 
has mute pointer. Mute, forget about it. Okay. Um, expected. Yep, this will be as mute uh, U8 as a mutable pointer to this. Uh, as a cell. And we should be at 8 cycles. No, we're at 34. Oh, that's because we're doing random stuff. Because we're actually filling it in. If we don't fill it in, if we don't randomize it, maybe the, maybe the overhead wasn't too bad when we had a box slice. So that goes down to 6, of course. And then in this case... Yeah, it's still pretty bad on Mr. Dix. Uh, huh. I was kind of hoping that that would be able to look ahead and kind of optimize those things out. Rand in there. Looking that up. Okay. We did get a speed up. Um, not enough that I really care. So let's run this again. Gonna be the same thing. Probably all mispredicts again. Yep. Ooh, even worse on speculation. Even worse. Um. What if I had used uh, like R15? I don't know if I could reserve a register for everything. Um, all right, that's not helping us. So Rand, back to the normal Rand, get rid of this shit. Okay. So mispredicts are killing us. How can we, how can we help the processor? Um, I'm guessing mispredicts are maybe because it's getting the seed from memory in so many places. What if I put that in a global? Static, mute, RNG seed, U size is equal to thi uh, this. Um, I'm going to get rid of fuzzer. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this. And then I get rid of this. And then these don't take self anymore. That might help us a little bit. Um, expected self. Yep. Bye. Bye. Uh, Self.rand. Yep. This is just going to be rand. Okay. And then fn rand. Um, and this will return a U size. And here I'm going to do unsafe because it's a mutable global. Um, RNG seed, sort equals RNG seed 13, 17, 43. Okay. Yep. 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 And yep. Uh, fuzzer, not found, 26. Oops. Yep, that's going to be when it goes into here. Fragment zero. That's pretty good. Um, what if I get rid of the 43? I, I think this is going to hurt the RNG quite a bit. I'm just curious. It's hard to say if this is actually going to speed it up due to um, less complexity in the RNG. So if I do this, the RNG is pretty bad at this point. It might converge to a value. 
I don't know if we're getting random outputs at this point. So let me add this print back in. We're going to see if we're getting random outputs. I think it's going to converge to giving the same thing every time, and it is. Um, okay. So what about this? This gets a little bit more mixing in there. Um, that's at 32. Let's take a look at the output. Um, this RNG is much worse than having three. I'm just trying to see uh, how much room we have to improve uh, on the RNG side of things. So those outputs look pretty good. So we're going to throw this in and analyze it. Okay. We'll come back to that in a second. I don't know. Buff. Okay, so that's pretty solid. Not printing too often, so I don't think we're losing any perf on prints. Set length is fine. Um, bad speculation. Okay, and... Uh, average CPU frequency of 4.3 gigahertz. Core bound, retiring. So the bad speculation has gone down. So we helped with speculation a little bit there. Um, I want that seed. I want the RNG to be in. I really want that to be in our register at all times. And depth. What if I make depth decrementing? If I make depth, if depth is equal to zero, return offset. Here we're gonna do depth minus one. This might, this might be a slight improvement. Nope, not a big change. Not too surprised there. Um, if depth is equal to zero, okay. Okay, so that's, that's about what I'd expect. Uh, let's go to 16 depth. And let's see how that changes here. Um, let's go to 16 depth here. Python average. Uh, what about eight? Okay, so the perf gets a little bit better in that case. Let's run that for a little bit longer. In the case for me, at 8 depth, I think I slaughter them on perf. Um, and that's probably roughly the level that I unroll to. Oh, no, it's about the same. I thought we were getting really good throughput on that. Are we on... Oh, that was on HT HTML. On HTML, we get some like nutty perf through that. Yeah. HTML, we're getting two gigs a second of throughput. <laughs> um, let's go to like a little bit more depth. We'll go to 32 depth on that. Oh, shit. Um... That is not a release build. Um, uh, and I could check that by doing this. I think we'll see a crash due to an integer underflow. Like a panic. Oh, okay. Uh, unless we're not hitting that si situation. Cycle per byte, that, 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 that. Um. Um. Okay, maybe it is, maybe it is, uh, I guess debug builds probably specify a flag. So Rusty in this case is, I guess, okay. 
I wanted to see if they were doing uh, integer overflow and underflow checks on all of the accesses. So we got JSON, back to JSON. All right. So with this global, I guess this is more fair. This is a this is a good RNG here in this state. And it's comparable. It's pretty much the same. Uh, it's it's too close to even consider it different. Um, they're both at basically 35. Um, huh. I think without direct control of the code generation at this point, it's going to be hard to like make it um, much better than this. Um, I still think that there's room for a 2x. Yeah. I still think a 2x is, is totally possible. Um... That's seed too large? No, because that's masking it down. I think our mispredicts are all based on, on this, this RAND. Um, like, we're just getting slaughtered by, by those mispredicts. Like, in this case, in this case, it's 14 gigabytes per second. But it's not it's not fair because it's doing the same thing every iteration. Um, but let's see what this looks like. I think we know that this one has no bottlenecks on any part of the pipeline. Close that. This just won't have any mispredicts. We get we have a two x if we improve mispredicts, but that's kind of hard with a random number generator. Um, by potentially doing more, uh, while you're waiting for that random number, like if, <sighs> uh, effective core usage, memory bound, core bound, but yeah, no shit. Um, no mispredicts at all. Um, memory bound, that's not a big deal. We're literally writing 13 gigs per second. Um, cycles per byte can't really get any lower than that, and then uh, CPI rate that's a little bit high. Um, yeah, how do we, how could we architect this to save on the mispredicts? If I could like generate the random number like 10 instructions earlier, that could potentially help. Um, honestly, going to a, going to indirect branches might actually help. Um, if I use indirect branches, That could actually be an improvement. Because the processor is probably trying to predict things based off of random noise, and then it does a mispredict, and then it has to unwind hundreds of cycles, where it would be better if it just waited for the correct result. Um, so, how can I coerce that? If I did a, so that's going through, that's emitting a match statement with all the different things. I could maybe emit an array and then call the function directly. Um,
Hmm. Ah, what do I want to do here? Is that Rand? I could put like R15, maybe. Um. I could put everything in a naked function. Custom LVM pass that reserves R15. Yeah. I know I can get rid of some of the memory accesses. I feel like I can get rid of some of the mispredicts. I'm going to have to pock this in an isolated environment. Um... That being said, uh, F1 has pretty good performance results there. I still think that uh, going to assembly is kind of overkill for the results that they're getting. Um, and I think um, I I don't think it I don't think it falls into the like some of the claims that they're making where it's much faster than X, Y, and Z situations. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a good mutator. I think it's considered, or a good uh, generator. And I think it, it should be like, yes, this paper is good. Absolutely. Conclusion, this paper is good. Um, but I think their claims are a little bit bold. I don't think they're being very realistic with some of the comparisons they're making. Um, but yeah, I mean, Hopefully it gets some adoption. Um, I would love to see them switch to generating, let's say, C or Rust. Um, like the first example that I had where I wasn't doing unsafe um, at all uh, means you're never going to have a crash in the generation. We saw their stuff crash in many different ways. Uh, we're not using any globals, so that means we can scale to multiple threads. Uh, we're not like... I think their um, execution could be a lot better and their the code gen that they have is pretty bad. Um, I'm actually surprised that they're getting the perf they're getting uh, by like writing a byte at a time. I'm actually really surprised by that. Um, but I think in both of our cases, we're bottlenecking on branch mispredicts. So the like having the right one byte at a time might not be a huge issue. Although they seem pretty call heavy. So I'm going to look into, um, uh, let's see if naked functions work in Rust. I think they do. Um, uh, what do I want to do? Uh, Rust.goggles. And we're going to see if we can get a naked function. Um, and I think we can. Otherwise, we can do... Mm, Okay, um, fn foo, pub fn foo, uh, asm int three, intel volatile, uh, use of unstable, yep, uh, feature asm, uh, Nightly. Okay, unsafe. Good. Okay. Now, what I want to do is... What if I put a ret in here? What happens? Double ret? Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, rust. I think there are naked functions in Rust. It looks like there is... Uh, as well as comparisons with globalism. Um, okay. 
So I've got a really interesting hybrid approach that I think will get us really good performance. If we use naked functions and then implement the functions in assembly, that means we can use an arbitrary calling convention while still having Rust perform inlining. Um, the inlining is going to be the most complex part of the process. I don't, I, I don't know if it will for naked functions. So where is this at? Uh, um, where is naked? It's got to be a flag tracking issue for this. It's still open. Uh, pound naked. Is that it? Uh, yep. Naked functions. Okay. So, um, and the ret, it doesn't really matter if there are two rets, but we'll just do this. A naked function should never, uh, um, let a equal to zero. Um, I don't think this will allow allocation of, uh, uh things on, so if I did, if I did this, u8, and returned an a, um, Okay, that makes sense. Uh, that, that's just going to return that. Um, okay. So I think if I just do assembly in a block here, and, um, oh, is it going to have a calling convention? So that's what I need to see. Pub fn, so in put u8, then test. Uh, this is going to then call foo with an input of 5. Um, and it's going to move it into, it's going to move that into EDI. Damn it. Um, oh, dash O. Okay. Yep. Naked. Pull that in. Okay. And I think, as long as I don't declare a local anywhere, and I only use inline assembly blocks, I mean, that obviously got inlined, right? So foo5, that got inlined. Um, and so naked basically means you won't be setting up the like arguments in the same way, and you won't have the same frames. Uh, what that means is that now I can do this. Um, so foo... Um, in this case, I can do, I can have everything take no arguments, um, and then I can do an assembly here, and I could do like, uh, oops, uh, move R15 5, and that should persist. Um, uh, unsafe. Okay. So move R15, 5, and then we have the int 3. So this did indeed get inlined. Um, now, it won't get optimized. So if we have redundant, stupid things, uh, we're going to kind of run into issues there. But it means that we should be able to get rid of basically all memory reads and writes that aren't directly, um, that aren't directly updating the fuzz output. So that means we'll be able to reserve a register to be the base pointer for the output. We'll be able to have a register reserved for the RNG, and we'll be able to have a register that's reserved for um, a register that is reserved for uh, um, the offset into the buffer. So we should be able to write everything using naked functions, and basically kind of do everything manually while still getting the inlining from Rust. Um, now, it's not going to necessarily optimize. So if we had like a move R15, uh, let's say D word pointer this. And then if we called foo twice, we're going to see two of those. Um, and I don't think volatile will change anything there. Yeah. So um, it's going to be kind of dumb about inlining. So we won't be able to have it merge instructions together, but it will inline things uh, so that we don't have to worry about it. So we can write our structures in kind of a similar way to what we had before. Um, but I think we'll uh, I think we'll benefit a lot more. So I'll be right back. I'm gonna use the restroom.
let's see what we can cook up. This is going to be a little gnarly. Um, so anyways, conclusion, paper's really good. Um, I think some things are embellished. A lot of things were made more complex than they needed to be. Um, I've written fuzzers that are very, very similar. And if they're not generic, uh, the performance probably will be pretty damn good. Um, so, I don't know. Just be careful with your claims. Um, I think that when we get into assembly, we might actually be able to outperform. But we're at parity, and we're generating rust. Um, and I, I think our code is a lot simpler. Um, but that's more of an engineering problem, so that's not a big deal. But I would say that hopping to assembly was really unnecessary for, for what they ended up doing. Um, and I think it's, it's dangerous to kind of do that. So we're going to start, we're going to create our buffer. Uh, we're going to keep track of how many bytes we've generated. We'll start a counter, um, start two different counters, and we'll use that to determine the time. Uh, everything is good. We just need to call the fragment. Okay. So, if we look at fragment, currently we have that generating a function. That's checking on depth. And depth, that's going to be an argument that's going to get passed. And, like, there are a lot of things that I think we can improve there. Um... So what I'm going to do is we're still going to call it fragment. There are no args anymore. And now um, I'm going to set up an assembly block. Whoa, can I do this inside? Uh, volatile um, Intel. Okay. So here I'm going to do uh, move R15... Uh, leet, 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 leet. That's our seed. And... Yes, uh, that's pretty good. So I need to push R15. Anything that we're going to use, uh, I'm going to need to save. And then I need to restore that after. Um, pop R15. So this should be fine. And we're going to say there's a memory clobber here, because there is. Um, by writing to the stack. Okay, unterminated raw string, uh, yep, uh, and I think if I double hash it, I think I'm fine there. Um, I might need to put something in there, ASDF, I think that works, unterminated raw string, uh, ASDF. Okay, not fun in the scope. Perfect. Um, so we're going to push R15, we're going to move the seed into R15, and then we're going to call our fragment thing. Um, and in this case, we're going to have offset, so we're going to make a register allocation here. So we're going to say that R15 is the RNG seed. We're going to say that uh, R14 is the um, uh, offset, and R13 is going to be the buffer. And I hope, I hope I can write the assembly like this. I might have to call the uh, original, the root level fragment directly. Let's just do that. Then we don't need the pushes and pops. Zor R14, R14. Um, R13 will be passed in. So we're going to pass in into R13. We're going to pass in uh, buff.as mute pointer. And we're going to clobber R14, R13, R14, and R15 get clobbered. And memory gets clobbered, and uh, conditional flags are going to get clobbered as well. So I'm going to do a call of whatever that function was, uh, fragments. Um, this, 
and that will be yep that will be the okay fragment that uh r13 so that will call into bear uh rand has not been found yet we're just gonna uncomment or we're gonna comment all of that out um type test.rs okay so that's gonna call fragment 22 so xor xor those out 13, 14, 15, all clobbered, memory and CC, clobbered. Um, okay, that looks pretty good. Um, inline assembly must be a string literal. Uh, what is the correct way to do that? Rust multi-line string. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, raw string. Um, Uh, is an R followed by the content. Non greedy, looking for that. So it looks for the match. Um, they start with that, followed by zero or more of those. The raw string bot. Okay, so I think if I do two. So I don't think I can name them, but I think I can use change the amount. Uh, and it looks like Vim probably doesn't have support for this. Um, but I think this is still going to work. Uh, oh, maybe not. Maybe I need to do more on the outside. There we go. Offset not found in the scope. Um, in this case, we're going to put into uh, let offset u size. Um, and then we'll just do, uh, this will output into, um, R14. This will get the offset. Okay. Uh, inline assembly is unsafe. Yep. Thank you. And we'll tab that in. 12. Okay. Okay, that built uh fragment 22 not yep unresolved external perfect and then uh type test.rs uh that looks good so that's gonna return out r14 into the offset r13 will get the buffer um technically we don't actually clobber r13 so we'll say that not that it really matters okay okay so then we now have to create the functions. And I think we need to make these naked for it to be safe. So we'll do program plus equals naked. Okay. Doesn't have rand, doesn't output this anymore. Uh, depth, uh, let's say R12 is depth. Um, move R12, uh, 32. Okay. And depth, we'll put in, um, yeah, we just have to mark that as clobber, R12. Sweet. Um, can't find pointer, yeah. So we've got fragment. We then uh, everything. I guess we write everything in assembly here. Which is going to be weird. We need to check the depth. Program plus equals asm. Um, then we're going to do a, uh, we're going to do, we're going to take an asm, we're going to make this raw, asm quotes, um, decrement, or, uh, test, r12, r12, um, actually we're going to handle the depth on the call side. 
that's what we're going to do. Okay. So we're going to match on our rand. Uh, so all of this we're going to write in our own way. And I think we're going to set that up in the data section. I think with global assembly, I might be able to create data sections. I'm not quite sure. So let's start with the easy one, the terminal case, ASM. Um, uh, program plus equals are this, two of those, quote, ASM. Um, in this case, one, two, three, four. I think it's four deep, uh, and then I'm going to comment these out just so we can kind of build this and get it tested and, like, see what the output is. So here I'm starting assembly block, and in this case, we're going to um, uh, then end the assembly block here. Uh, Intel volatile. And in this case, we want to write um, to that buffer. So we want to write the bytes. We're going to do it a byte at a time, the same way they kind of do it. Um, maybe? If I can set up a global, hmm. How do I actually want to do this? Okay, I'm going to do some weird shit. While um so while uh let pointer is equal to value. While a pointer dot length uh this is going to be equal to this. So we're going to slice up the value. This is going to be mutable. Um while pointer dot length is greater than 0. If pointer dot len is Greater than or equal to eight. Um, okay, so we're gonna do some really fun stuff here. Oh, I'm so stoked! This is what I like to do. Don't do this, by the way. The, like the perf, this perf is not required. Uh, what we're about to do is so unbelievably overkill. Uh, just don't do it. It's it's stupid. Um, but it's going to be fun. Type uh, test.rs. Okay. Uh, type and type test.rs. What's going on? Why is it getting stuck? Why is it getting stuck? Do you have an infinite loop here? No. Oh, yeah, this. Jesus. Um, pointer is equal to uh, pointer 8 dot dot. Otherwise, if the pointer length is greater than or equal to 4, Otherwise, if the pointer length is greater than or equal to 2, then we'll do a 4 to... I'm going to continue on these cases. Um, else, continue, uh, pointer uh, 1. All right. Whoop. Okay. Got a bunch of these naked function calls. And here's what we're going to do. Oh, I love this. Program plus equals format. You guys see where this is going, right? Um, assembly. We're going to do a move. Um, we're going to do a move of... Uh, R, what did we put it at? 
the buffer R13 plus the offset uh, R14. This is a quad word. Um, is it better for us to do that in one memory access? I think so. So we're going to do a move into racks. Of, so we need to mark that as a clobber. Uh, racks, RBX, RCX, and RDX. We're going to use for general purpose uh, storage. So move racks. Then what I'm going to move into racks will be a... Um, I'm going to move a value. And I'm going to hex it because I can. And it looks better that way. And then I'm going to do a move into this location, a quadrant pointer of racks. And that's it. Intel, volatile. Um, we're not going to worry about clobbers. In fact, we don't want to even say there are any clobbers. We do want to say a memory clobber exists here. Um, and then uh, uh, add R14.8. Actually, we don't even want to do that. OK. So blah, 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 some token stuff, uh, some formatting. Uh, yeah, all these need to get escaped. And I'm just going to do this, 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 this. And we have one format arg. This is going to be um, uh, let val is equal to uh, let val is equal to uh, u64 from le bytes of the pointer uh, pointer dot dot eight dot try into dot unwrap. Okay. Uh, cool. Then we're gonna update. We're gonna advance the pointer, and then we're gonna emit this beautiful assembly here and we're gonna pass it a val all right let's see what you get uh it just needs to be a string and try into we just need to pull this into our project okay so somewhere in here we probably oh we don't have any eight bytes all right ah come on there we go Test.json, we're going to go into our JSON, test.json, we're going to just have like a, 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 okay, good, um, Really? Print pointer is pointer dot len. What is going on here? One, 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 two, three, four. No typo. Oh, yeah. Six, seven, eight. There we go. So this is that one case. Here we're going to move 4 and 4 and 4 and 4 and 4 and into racks. Then I'm going to move that entire racks into R13 plus R14. Fucking great. Let's put a 9 in there too. Just because we can. We'll have a 9 and a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so those are incorrect, of course. This now can be an immediate D word. That can hold any value, so we don't need to have the move racks. Um, this is now a 4, this is a U32. Same for here, same for here. I don't like this code du duplication. I should probably write a macro. Um, U8, U, U16. 
byte pointer word pointer. Son of a bitch. One. Eight eight four four two two one one. There we go. So when we have one byte, we load it. When we have two bytes, oh, and let's put a semi new. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, it's gross. I know. Okay. So, and, uh, whoa. What is going on with that new line? Oh, you know what? I think I just need to do this. Just actually put a new line in there. Yep. And then it doesn't like that that's tabbed in. So you have to do this. Yeah. Okay. So, in the one byte case, we load one byte to this location. In the two byte case, we load two bytes to this location. Three byte case, we do a word and then a byte. Um, and let me do this. Let offset is equal to uh, pointer dot as pointer as u size minus value dot as pointer as u size because that was wrong. Um, plus offset plus offset plus offset plus offset. Okay, in this case, the offset is after, and then in every other case, the offset is first. Okay, and then at the end, I'm going to do a uh, program format similar to this. Um, this is going to be uh, value.len. We're going to add uh, r14 with this. Um, and this is value.len. Okay. Okay, so now... We correctly add zero, that's fine, that'll get optimized out by the assembler. Um, then we're going to add R14 one, good. In the case of two bytes, we add two. In the case of three bytes, we write to zero, then we write to two, then we add three. In the case of four bytes, we write the whole thing, five bytes, so on and so forth, right? And here's our eight byte case. We're just loading that uh, immediate, and we load that into offset zero in the nine byte case we load an immediate we load that immediate into uh r13 plus r14 plus zero and then at r13 plus r14 plus eight we load for one and then we add uh nine to the uh, offset fucking love it okay there's really no benefit to doing um i guess if I did put those into uh, a global, I could potentially use like the fast string operations for things that are greater than 16, um, where I do like a rep stows B. Um, but in this case, we're always going to just emit the fewest number of stores that we have to, and then we're going to only increment the offset once. Done. Okay. Now, And I don't think this will save or restore anything when we do uh, naked calls. I hope not. I really hope not. Otherwise, this whole idea is wrong. Let's try it. Let local OX41 32. What happened? Um, uh, print local. What 
what happens when there's an invocation here? Foo. Here we see our two moves. It doesn't look like for naked functions that they are saving and restoring anything. Um, I guess I don't have many locals that are like being used. Uh, five, let local two, six, local three, seven, four, eight. Let's see, uh, test. I don't know if that's going to create locals. It's just going to pass those in as constants. Shit. Uh, here. That'll probably help. Move R15 5. That's going to call foo. Oh, uh, yeah, we do need to see if it is in line. I just want to know if it's going to save and restore registers. I don't think it is. Um, prolog and epilog three functions. Complete control over the stack layout and interpretation. Um, yep. I guess I guess these functions aren't going to have any locals. We're doing some really weird shit here, but technically they'll never have locals. So we should be able to call fragments in here. Let's see if this works. No. Arm safe. No problem. Arm safe. Okay. Fragment one. Uh, ye. Really? Um, so this is what it's produced, and that's calling fragment one. Fragment one is, uh, I guess it doesn't have a, a symbol there. Um, I might have to just put a little one of these bad boys in there, a little underscore. Um, I can say no mangle. It might be mangling it. Oh, shit. Nice. Okay. Okay. Wow. Nice. Progress. Um, non-terminal case. Nah, fuck it. Expression case. Here I just have to call a bunch of functions. It's that fucking easy. So, here I'm just going to... I'm not going to emit assembly. I'm literally just going to call them. With no args. Um. I think this is correct. And since this won't have any locals, since it's naked, um, yeah, so like here we have fragment 25, that calls, okay, let's, uh, let's throw this into Godbolt, see what happens. I feel like I scrolled past the start, maybe not. There it is. Oh, yeah. Fragment zero, fragment six. All right, fragment 25. Oops. By God, please inline. Uh, pub on safe FN. Please inline. Fragment, uh, where's fragment 25? Where's that at? Fragment 24. 
I mean, that's inline. Oh, wait, that's not the one that was called. That calls fragment 15. Perfect. Um, what? Where's 25? How does that not exist? Fragment 25. Okay. Uh, for some reason, no mangle. There's not another one, is there? No. Um, that's really weird. Oh, maybe no mangle in pub called an issues? Whatever. Okay. So those get inlined, and we just perform all the different things. Uh, it's not terribly efficient because we don't group those together. Um, uh, I can write an optimization pass that bulks those together, that merges anything that is uh, contiguous groups of, of constants. Um, so I'm going to optimize that. We can fix that. We can fix that at the uh, structure level. Okay. Finally, we have to implement non-terminal. This is the one that sucks. So, we basically want this assembly. And we're going to go into here. And we're going to do some inline assembly. Okay. Two in. Yep, that looks good. Good. And then this ends with a that. Uh, double. Offset val, they don't exist. Yep. I just want to see if that is looking good, and I think it should be. Okay. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Okay. Um Yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. I think this is more readable. Um Okay, and for this, what I need to do is I need to generate a random number. So to do this, I'm going to do uh, XOR, or I'm going to do a move racks R15, shift left of racks by 13, XOR racks by um, R15 by racks, 17, 43, shift right. XOR that with rack. So make a copy of it, shift it left by 43, XOR it in. That is door shift. Okay. And then I'm going to do a um what is the best way to do this? Uh um What do I want to do? Um, I need to make data. I don't know if I can. Is that allowed? Can I do that? Let me get rid of the fat LTO. Because that's hurting my build times. And target CPU. Not needed anymore. Uh, okay. Break instruction fragment. Zero. Uh, blah, three. Where the 
Uh, what? Oh, yeah, it goes off the deep end. Um, in three. Nice. So that's executing. Um, and if we look at R13 points to this, R14 is zero, and R15 is this random number. Huh. Okay. And rack should be kind of the top part. Okay, so that, well. Okay, so now I need to, I'm going to do a div, which is totally wrong. But I'm going to just do it temporarily. I'm going to do a move RCX. Uh, technically, I'm going to do a move ECX. Um, it's the fastest. I'm going to load the size. So this is going to be uh, options dot one. I'm going to do a div of, uh, I'm going to do a C uh, XOR EDX EDX to zero out the top part. And I'm going to do a div. Um, I guess I need to move EAX, or EAX is fine in this case, from R15D, div ECX. It's terrible, I know. It's really bad. But the thing they mentioned in the paper is actually what we're going to end up doing. So good on them for that. That's a, seriously, the paper is really good. I, I hope I wasn't too critical when I, when I went through it. Okay, in three, move that, XOR, um, two or three times lower. Okay, I think I was getting like peaking showing up, but I think I kind of moved my microphone a little bit away. So I actually have a slightly different audio setup than I traditionally have. There you go. Sorry about that. I have the peak light that kind of comes on here. But I don't think it's actually peaking, so I think it's fine. Um, let me know if it if it is. But but the peak light on my um, on my like mic mic sensor just keeps on. Yeah. Okay. Then we're gonna do that, and we're gonna div. Um, okay. And so RDX is zero. Racks is a random number. RCX is three. And that will leave RDX as the um, as the remainder, which is the modulo. It's terrible. Don't do this. Um, how fast is pop comp? I've got an idea. Uh, that's on the K10. Um, I want to look at... Oh, I just said a bad green bean. Damn it. Um, I want to look at Skylake. And then... Uh, pop count. Shit, it is very slow. Three cycle latency, one cycle reciprocal throughput. What did they do? They had a technique there for random number generation. I think it was good. Um, yep, it splits it up into pieces, but there's something where they, instead of a div, somewhere they mentioned divs, um, modules and division are costly, good. A more performant way to map a larger number to a smaller number is to divide both and take the upper half in terms of bits. What? Divide both. Okay, let's see what they do. Uh, 
I'm thinking of just doing a pop count and an and, which is about uh, four cycles. I'm curious if what they do is faster, and it might be. I don't quite understand what they mean by that. F1, Vim, F1, fuzzer, uh, random, uh, random. Extract one byte from the stream, advance the random cursor, multiply with the choices we have. And then it divides it by eight. Oh, I see what it's saying. Um, you have a two, it, it's a 256 bit thing. And if you have six options, um, you can divide both of them by like the number of bits. Um, actually, shift arithmetic right, EDX by eight. EDX is a, that's, that's the value. So it's dividing, then it multiplies it. Okay, so it multiplies and then it divides it by eight. Is that, is that true? Divide by number of bits. So I have a, if I have a random value, let's say uh, that's my random value. I'm gonna multiply it by EDI which is the random value. Oh, the random value, in this case, let's say it's a uh, uh, one byte. So let's B7, that's our random value. It's going to multiply that by val s, and val s is um, val fn choice, the number of things. So I'm gonna multiply it by, okay, I think this does make sense. So I'm gonna multiply that by like, I want to select four. Now I have 732, and then I'm going to right shift by eight. Um, uh, right shift by uh, eight, which is getting rid of the number of bits in the random number pool, and now that's two. And that makes sense because the, the top bytes can only be a couple of the things. So if I did FF, um, that's actually really cool. That's a neat technique. I like that. So I'll multiply that by four. So that's the maximum possible value that I could get. If I right shift this by eight, I should get three, and I do. Um, it's basically using the overflow. It's using the, the bits of overflow after a, multi uh, after a multiply. Um, that is faster than a pop count, so that's better. So we're gonna steal that. Thank you. Really good idea. Um, so instead, I've got my random value in R15. I'm gonna make a copy of it into EAX R15D. I'm then going to multiply EAX um, by the number of choices we have. And I think I can use, um, there's options.length, okay. And now I'm gonna do a shift right of racks uh, this needs to be an I'm all racks because I'm using 32 bit. We're going to shift right by 32 and put an int 3 here. So, and if we think through the logic here, um, if I were to have worst case scenario, all F's for the random number, uh, multiply this by, let's say, 256 choices. Um, yep, and then if I right shift that by 32, there's the 255. Um, perfect. I really like that. That's a really good, uh, idea. Um, okay. So I should be able to go through int three, move EAXR 15, multiply racks by three. That means, uh, this one, oh, it might be zero in this case. Uh, it is. Then we're going to shift it to the right. Okay, it's zero. Good. The move is free. The IMUL is uh, half a cycle. Uh, reciprocal throughput, one cycle latency. So an IMUL um, 
Reg Reg Immediate. Oh, it actually is 3 1. It's the same as a pop count. Mm, are we saving time here then? Can I have a different destination here? Well, I need the Xerix done that. Then perform the IMO. Then the shift right by 32. Hmm. Okay. I thought IMO was a little bit faster. I mean, it's still f really fast. Um, it's comparable to pop count. If I did an and, that would be the same as the shift. Um, this is better. This, this is uh, more applicable. Okay. Cool. And if I get rid of the... Uh, if I get rid of the... Let me see if I can do data. Um, red uh, bytes... Uh, X21. Let's see if I can do that. Will that put that in the data section? Or will that end up putting a 21 in there? And it looks like it doesn't. So I'm going to say label foo bar. Foop bar. And I'm going to do a an int3 lea rel. Uh, I'm going to do lea into racks of uh, rip plus foop bar. And we'll say like. 2, and I can say 2F. So, uh, you rip. This is going to load this. That's a 21. Is that in code? Is that in code space? Um, no. It's not. Okay. I mean, the rest of that kind of looks codey. Like, that looks like code here. But I think that is putting it in the data section in a separate location. So then I can then do racks here, and that points to there. Um, that looks good. Okay. So now I need to make my table. And to do that, I'm going to do a quadward, quad. Let me see if that works. Whoa. Maybe pointer. Uh, word. Uh, out of range for word, double. Uh, oh, is it giant word? Gward. God. Uh, giant. What am I eating? I'm eating uh, green beans. <laughs> yeah, I, I love green beans. It's, I don't know. It's a good snack that doesn't make me feel terrible about myself. Um, what am I going to do here? I need to um, gas quadrant. Maybe I can do dot long. Oh my god. How do I define a quad word in a in gas? Mm -hmm. Gas and text. Bite. Doot, 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 doot. Quad. Yep. Def. Nope. I don't know, gas syntax. I'm pretty sure I've done this before. Here we go. Dot bite. H word, half word, int, long, short, sleb, uleb, and a word. Two, oh, eight byte. Unaligned eight byte long big num values. I don't think it's what I want to use, but we'll use it. You rip, uh, look at the address for this. Looks good. DQ. Leet, leet. Um, 
It is weird that there's like a ret there. It, do <laughs> it doesn't seem right. Um, Cause that should go directly into like a ret following it. I don't think it's putting that in the data section. That looks like it's in the middle of code that's been aligned to a page with int threes. Uh, you rip L uh, 100. Maybe not. Maybe it did put that in the data section. Why is there no ret from fragment zero? Um, dot code. Uh huh. Maybe. Maybe. Text. Uh, so if I didn't have data here, there should be a ret immediately following this, I think. Um, Yep, we don't have a label anymore. You rip. There's the ret. So for some reason, when we do data, we don't really get the ret. That maybe makes sense, because it can't like figure that out. It's not being too smart. Uh, so we'll just do this. We'll just add our own ret. So that's going to LEA racks of this table. And then we're going to put the table in the data section. We could also just make a global, maybe, like a constant global um, in the application. But we'd have to be in the right context to do that. Uh, so I'm just going to do this instead. So I'm going to do a um, options. Uh, if I do this, that's wrong. I know this is wrong. Um, fragment ID that. Uh, so if I do options dot map x x dot zero, this is also going to be wrong. Um, options dot iter. This is very close. It just has the little square brackets in there. Um, what? Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's gonna do that. Okay, so we're gonna do let table is equal to um, uh. Let table is equal to uh, string new. Once again, this is on the uh, build time, so we don't have to do this many times. So string new, I'm going to do for option in options. Uh, I guess I need the option ID is all I actually care about. Uh, in zero dot dot options dot len. Then I'm going to uh, table plus equals um, uh, fragment this under this format option ID and uh, we can maybe put commas in there I don't know if it's gonna like a trailing comma it might not uh, so this will be table Ah, uh, yes, unknown token. Okay, so we'll just do a, like, uh, um, uh, if option ID is not equal to options dot len minus one, uh, table plus equals comma space. Mm-hmm. Whoa, let's see. So now I'll say fragment zero, one, two, zero, one, two. Um, oh, that is totally not what I want. Where was I using option ID? Was I? 
Uh, oh, is this? Okay, yeah. For option and options. I was about to say, oh, option ID dot iter dot enumerate table plus equals fragments option ref that uh, dot zero. Okay, so this says fragment four, eight, or twelve, and then if we looked at uh, four, eight, or twelve, four, eight, or twelve. 4, 8, or 12, 4, 8, 12. Okay, so those should then be resolved to the addresses for those things. So if I do an int 3, um, this should give me a, uh, at the point of a crash, I should have racks uh, points to fragment 11, 8, and 12. Sounds good to me. Uh, there's one. There's another, and there's another. Okay, looks good. Um, so I'm gonna do a jump of racks plus. RBX. RBX plus racks times eight. Do I wanna do a jump or a call? I need to do a call. In three, all right. Here we go, and in three, and we go into here, and fragment. Oh, I stepped over it like an idiot. Okay, go here into this. Now we're in fragment 11. We're going to run fragment 11. We update some stuff in the buffer. If we take a look at... Uh, R13, there we go, and if we look at R14, it should be right after um, L R14. Perfect, look at that, and then that rets, and then that rets, and then we're back here, and it's doing stuff. Oh, is that done? Is that it? That has the random lookup that calls our random function. Looks good to me. Okay. Uh, all right. R15D. R15 is that. We're using the same R15 every time. Uh, so I want to have this take in uh, a seed. And we want like a better seed here. Eh. So I mean, this is giving the same thing every time. Uh, and it seems to be working. Maybe. I don't know why that is doing so many A's, but we also have an optimization pass we can do there. Um, can I borrow some brain power? Sure. It's all in the green bean. What do you want to learn? Okay. Pointer. So what is my syntax for this? Oh, I did the sequence. Yeah, no shit. Um, of course. Uh, so that is picking an expr and then it's picking value. So if I change to a different random state, let's just put like a three up there and like a nine there. That might give us a different output. Uh, not quite. There you go. There's a new random number. Um, okay, I just want to see different values. Well, the performance is good, 9 gigs a second. Um, it's not realistic, though. So, I guess this R15, I want to pass in to R15, uh, uh, We'll just pass in RDTSC. This is not good right now, but that's actually going to kill our perf pretty heavily. 
Okay, why are we always getting the same thing? Um, let's put an int 3 on this. And in this case, R15D, I'm all racks by that. Shift right by 32. Get RBX by that. Oh, I totally don't have to do that. I think... Oh, I do have to, because for this repel. Okay. R... Rax is 1. R15 is... Randomness. Randomness. Um... And I guess I can get rid of... Let's get rid of the print filtering temporarily. Let's say if iters and zero is equal to zero. Always true. Um, so we'll hopefully be able to see what it does. So R15. And fragment 8 is then used. Um, what is the bug? What is the stupid bug? Um, oh, we also don't handle depth yet. That'll be an issue shortly. Am I test.json? Val can be one of these things. An expert, it starts with an expert. An expert can be a value directly. It can be an expert plus a value. It can be an expert minus a value. Uh, pretty cool. Is that always picking the same thing? So it'll make a decision right away. So the first decision it will make is uh, here. It's going to decide between val, expert. It's going to decide between these three conditions. And in this case, it's deciding with two, two, one. Fragment eight. R15, shift. Uh, I'm all with three, shift right. And then this is going to look at that. Uh, DBR14. R13. What am I doing wrong here? I'm doing something stupid. Uh, so in an expression, we do all the things in sequence. And I think we did that correct. Um, but the decision, when we go to make a decision, I'm going to construct this table of all the options. And the options are going to be the fragments, which are the function names for the things that we can call. We're going to put those here. All right, let's see if that's working correctly. Um, DPS, uh, oops. Uh, DPS of RBX. 11, 8, or 12. Okay. Uh, fragment 11. So we're going to take a look at what fragment 11 does. Fragment 11 is the one that prints everything. So that is Exper. Um, and they should be in order as well. So fragment 11 is val. And it checks out. If we were to go down that path, we're going to do val and we're going to dump all this crap. Otherwise, fragment 8 hopefully, has uh, a chain of multiple things. Whoa. That doesn't seem right. Um, that That's indicating that it's making a random choice. Oh, because it is, because it's making an expert. So it has to start with an expert, and then calls, ooh, Ooh, I'm returning out early. I think this is an issue. This ret, I think, is killing me. Um, um, since I'm doing this ret, I will only do the first thing, and then I'll stop, so I won't get to the next part. Um, oh, shoot. What if I put the data at the start? Or kind of, maybe, maybe, maybe kind of, in three, text. If I do text, what happens here? I need to have a way that I can get the organic ret. Because otherwise, when this goes to write multiple things for an expression with multiple fragment calls, um, this will end up killing it. 
because uh, it won't do anything more. So, I could make globals. I could pre-process all the fragments, and I could make a global. Or I could make a constant here. Um, yeah, I could do. Uh, what is this print? What does this look like? We're gonna have to put this in. Uh, yeah, I think this should do the trick. Uh, I need to close this, okay, and cargo on release, and this. All right, so that's going through, that does text, and we basically want to get rid of text and data, and we'll come back to this in a bit when we figure it out. But this should produce kind of the right things. Uh, table is unused, yep. Okay. Okay, so if I take a look in three, I should, in some situations, see that there's going to be uh, kind of more after this. There we go. So these are kind of the different fragments I can have. So if I look at fragment four, uh, test fragment four. You rip, okay, that's going to do an int three followed by a ret, and that is the original ret. Uh, X fragment. Where's fragment four? Oh, there nothing references it, so it got optimized out. Um, okay, so we gotta uh, we gotta put that up in a globally boy. I think if I do a as you size, that should be good. Okay, and then we'll just put uh, some little brackets on there. And that's looking pretty solid. And then I'll do a, a constant um, a table a dispatch. And then we're going to name this. We're going to give it a... Uh, this is the ID for the fragment that we're in right now. Uh, constant that, which is... a. Uh, 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 slice of u sizes equals to this. In fact, I'm going to say this. We're going to give it an explicit length, which is the uh, options.len. And then semi. And put some commas in here, because that looks terrible. OK. So dispatch for all these different things. Fragment 4 is u size. Put a semi in there. Um, actually, since we're just in this scope, I think we can just call it dispatch. I don't need to give it an ID. Okay, dispatch 4812, okay. So then here we'll do program plus equals format this. Um, casting pointers to integers as constants is unstable. Oh, okay, then we'll do a uh, function and get rid of the as you size, maybe, oops. Please, 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 please. Uh, okay, unsafe. Perfect. Okay, so now we have function pointers, and now we should have a fragment uh, four. Because it's a fragment four. Oop, is that getting optimized out? Okay, let's see what happens when I pull in dispatch. So we're going to pass in to here, we'll pass into RBX, we'll pass in dispatch. Oh, probably because it's never used. Okay, now this will make it used as pointer. Uh, RBX is that. Um, there's no argument named RBX. There we go. <laughs> okay, you uh, fragment four. There it is. Fragment four is apparently the same as fragment eleven. Um. 
Okay, so now my int three, and I should have in RBX, uh, RBX DPS RBX that has my lookups to these different functions. Looks good. So now I should be able to do a call RBX plus racks times eight. And uh, let me put an int three in here just to see. So this should be good. Uh, you rip. Um, DPS RBX, here are different calls. So this is the first one, this should just be emitting. The second one, this should now have a couple different RNGs in here. That has a call, and then it inlined the next part where it writes it out, and then somewhere in here there's probably a plus. Yeah, 2B. And then, okay, and then that writes out. <laughs> All right, here we go, I think it works now. Yes, it does. Uh, okay, cycles per byte. Yep. Yeah, that's because we're printing so much, so let's turn our prints down a bit. Oh, geez. What's the perf going to be? Oh, boy, that's really good. <laughs> okay, so that's six gigs per second. All right. And that's not really fair because our values are kind of weird. So we're going to do uh, six... Um, five and six, I guess these will be the different values that we can have. Okay. So five, six, six minus six. Uh, okay. That looks like that's working. Um, 137 megabytes per second. Okay. Let's see if this just works on HTML. Probably won't because I don't have the depth. I think we're going to get stack, stack exhaustion. And uh, we get an access violation here. Ooh. Well, that's not good. Um, RBX is not surviving. I think I might need to make this a uh, global symbol. Because um, passing this in... I think is hurting. Uh, unless that was stack exhaustion. Let's see. Let's see if we get any prints. So we'll end with zero. Uh, yep. EB rip. I'm guessing RBX is... DDRAX, so that's fine. Um, RBX came from RAX, and RAX was this. Ah, uh, yeah, it thought it thought RAX had the thing, and it and it didn't, because the compiler's trying to be smart. Uh, it loaded RBX with this. And then I'm guessing it probably thought for some reason that it could stay there. I think we need to, uh, we're, we're kind of on thin ice here. Um, can I do no mango on this? On a constant. Okay. Uh, constant items should never have, uh, fine. I'll do pub static. Dispatch is already defined. Perfect. Um, maybe I can just do static. Dispatch already defined. Okay, so here we're going to do dispatch under this. And we're going to do it for the... Uh, this is going to be on the ID. Uh, dispatch not found in the scope. Perfect. So we don't want to pass this in. And I want to make sure that we still... I think since we're doing static... We hopefully should have those not getting optimized out. So we had like fragment four. Okay, it doesn't exist. I think if we make this pub static, we're fine. Fragment four. Ooh, that's a problem. Uh, oh, fragment four maybe doesn't exist in this case because uh, we're in a different version. Let me go down and change this back to test. Okay. 
uh, db uh, u fragment four. Uh oh. Uh, u uh, x star dispatch. Um, test. We should have it in test. We don't. Uh, pub. We did mark it public, right? Pub public static. Dispatch that. Um, I gotta convince it that that's being used. Pub. If I make all the fragments pub, maybe. Uh, pub unsafe function fragment. Okay. U fragment four. X test fragment star. I mean, maybe the, you know, it might be smart enough that since I don't reference dispatch. So I think if I said like, program plus equals uh, let this equals dispatch under this. Uh, let's just see if we can get it into here. So here we'll load lea racks rip plus dispatch. Now, I don't know if I can do this. It might not be happy about that. Um, this is going to be the... Um, ID, ID, okay, and int3 on that, so LEA racks of that, fragment 4, hey, okay, it might be smart enough, um, DPS dispatch, oops, uh, X test dispatch star, okay, so we do have all of these now because they're referred to in the assembly, and if I look at disassemble backwards, uh, racks, that should be dispatch one, DPS, that's the fragments, that looks good. Um, okay, so LEA into RBX that, and then call that, and now we shouldn't crash anymore. So this should work just fine on this example, and it looks great. Uh, we're just printing a lot, and then if I go to HTML, this shouldn't crash anymore. We probably will get stack exhaustion crashes, but we probably won't get a, a C05. Oh, did I have a stack depth check? I mean, this looks good. Maybe none of them are cursed far enough, but I mean, this is working. <laughs> this is working, I guess. Uh, All right, do that. See what happens. Holy shit, that's fast. Nice. Here we go. Waiting for the first prints. Maybe FF was too much. I think just a single F extra there was fine. Okay. 235 megabytes per second. I don't think we're using depth. R12. Nope, we're not using that. Uh, okay. So this is a big improvement from what we had before. This is now 235 megabytes per second. Uh, let's go to JSON. JSON.JSON. Oh, there we go. There's our nice stack overflow. Uh, okay, so we want to, before we do a call, I want to do a... Um, I want to do a, a decrement of the depth. So this is the only place that we do a call. I guess we do a call in the term, uh, in this case, because that will become a call. Maybe I should have it at the start. I don't, uh, expression. So expression, that's going to call a bunch of things and the expressions can keep going into sub expressions. Um, but eventually, I think expressions should collapse just fine. Expressions will only ever go one deep. 
Um, so here, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a decrement of R12, R13, R12. I'm going to go, uh, um, can I do that safely? It starts at 32. Let's say it started at 1. If I decrement it, uh, uh, I guess I need to test it first. If it's 0, then go to 2F, and we're going to make 2. So it's going to skip the call in that case, and uh, OK. In this case, depth, uh, we'll decrement it. So if R12 is 0, then we're going to skip calling into this. Um, honestly, we can just do this. Uh, so uh, check if we are out of depth. Um, depth looks good. Decrement depth. Uh, generate a random number. Mod the random number by options.len. Uh, call the random routine. And then at the end here, uh, inc r12 uh, increment depth. I think that's working. 31 cycles per byte. Uh, we're now at 97 megabytes per second. Um, that's pretty good. That's damn good. I don't know. What are your thoughts? That, that was a, uh, we were running like 35 before, I think, or like 36. Um, so 36 minus 31.8, it's actually not that much faster. Uh, 36, uh, about 11% faster. Uh, let's see what this has to say. Let's see where we're stuck. And it's probably predictions again. Okay. It's going to be branch predictions for sure. Here we go. Yep. Yep. About the same as before, but faster. So we did improve it. Um, how does it work in our test case now? Test.json. Cycles per byte. HTML. Okay. So that's obviously a lot faster because these tokens are a lot longer in length. And when we have longer tokens, that means that we're able to um we're able to kind of do a lot more in one fell swoop. Um All right. So it's interesting is that this gets compiled down to an executable. This should also work on Linux just fine. So if I do uh, whistle, um, I should be able to do this uh, dot slash test. Yeah, so it works on Linux as well. Um, that's what I like to see. Uh, that's how I write my fucking code. So where am I getting slowed down? Bad speculation. Um, mm -hmm. depth looks good, decrement the depth, increment the depth, go to two, so we skip that whole thing if we're uh, at a bad depth. Uh, that's going to cause like a couple branches there that we don't necessarily want. Um, okay. Let's see. That's beautiful. 
Oh, is that going to show per thing? Oh, man, this is so nice. I can't believe they made this free. So we've got one uh, fragment, 382. Um, uh, oh, I need to, I need to rebuild it. Um, cause that was on an old version. I think Jason was the one giving us the biggest problems. Yeah, we're only getting about a hundred megs a second on that. Um, let's see. Run. Here we go. Finalizing results. I might do the bite by bite RNG now that I can control it better. I don't know how much that's going to help. But. We can kind of do whatever we want now. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's a lot of bad speculation. God damn it. <laughs> Not so bad. 25% <laughs> microarchitecture usage. <clears throat> so we don't have a 5x anymore. We have a we have a 4x. Okay, so retiring front end bound bad speculation in these functions. Okay. Uh, bad speculation. 10% on test R12, R12. So just on our depth check, we are throwing... We are throwing a lot in the trash. Bad speculation. Uh, we have bad speculation here. Um, this makes sense. Uh, this is likely when the speculation occurs on this. Inc R12 ret. Once again, the bad speculation there is on the return. I think if we switch this to not do calls, I think we would get a lot. Like, these functions are just too small. Um... Test R12, R12, Inc R12, clock ticks here, E33, I don't know if that's right, it doesn't seem accurate, um, the fact that we have the same amount of these, we, we should have the same amount of rets retired as everything else. I'm not quite sure. Um, that's jumping to block seven. I'm not quite sure how that's going down. Uh, huh. Well, that's a that's a good one. <laughs> what is that? How much time are we spending in here? Holy shit. Holy shit. Um what? What? Can I get a symbol on this? Where are my symbols at? Um, oh. I think dash G test.rs. Okay, hopefully that'll help us out a bit. Get some simmies.
All right, there we go. Okay, come on. There we go. Bad speculation. Corbin. Okay. Let's see what we got. Fragment 382. A drop in place. Whoa. I don't think that's right. Um, let's see what we got here. Okay. Like, this is saying that we're spending... This is just a, a ret, I think. Like, that's what I think that is. This, like, drop in place closure. V clears. Okay. This. V source. Real drop in place. I think that is just a ret. So we have one of these that's doing nothing. Uh, let's add that to our optimization pass, maybe. Um, so it's perf looking like here. About 32. Okay. So I think uh, that's only possible here. Assert... Uh, expert.len is greater than zero. Okay. Uh, perfect. So there is a zero case. And in the case of a zero, we want to replace it with a... So terminals we can't optimize, but expressions that... Um, man, I feel like I'm working on my IL again. Um... <laughs> Um, let's see. Hey, I made code that hooks into an application without uh, changing the program code, the RAM. Instead, it exploits a Windows feature, a kernel driver. What do you think of this? I don't know how to sell this. Um, so did you write a driver that allows you to, uh, code that hooks an application without changing the program code? Um, it exploits a kernel driver? Um, I mean, you just, like, hook it from the kernel level. It uses the page protection. So, are you, are you modifying the memory from the kernel level, or are you just silently observing it? Um, and here, in this case, I want to add a nop. I'm going to make a fragment nop. And, um, 124. Match, fragment, nop, and a nop fragment, um, a nop fragment will replace its parent with a uh, nop, maybe. Um, so if expert.len is equal to zero, then we're going to replace, to replace is equal to sum index with a fragment nop break uh, next at k. Uh, down here, when we have a nop, uh, I don't want to ever actually have a nop. I think I want to remove them from expression lists. I want to remove them from vectors that refer to them. So we have a vector here and a vector here. Uh, NOP should just get removed from those. So I'm going to say that here, fragment NOP, um, panic shouldn't have NOP at compile time. OK, so we will. We're going to have a NOP at compile time. Um, so what I need to do is go through and um uh, I'm gonna say 
Okay, if the options length is equal to one, then we're gonna replace it with a clone of the fragment on the inside. Um, so that should propagate the knobs up. And then what I wanna do is uh, print, we'll print options here. And some of these are gonna have knobs in them. Um, so we're gonna do uh, four th uh, option and options. If option is equal to fragment nop, then we're gonna print that. Um, self dot fragments option dot zero. Uh, partial equality not implemented. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, EQ is not implemented, just partial EQ. Um, oh, yeah, because fragment ID. Okay. Print. Um, if one of the options is a NOP, then we want to remove it. So I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to do options dot. I can temporarily, I think, get mutable access to this. Uh, self dot fragments. Oh, it's borrowed up above. God damn it. In the iterator. Uh, we're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to do some changes to this. We're going to change this to um, dot len. Uh, for index in in self uh, zero dot dot self dot len to replace I think we can get rid of that um, we're gonna say um, we're gonna say self dot fragments dot self dot fragments um, options zero dot zero or index. So match fragment and fragment is going to be self dot fragments um, index, and that's going to have to be uh, we're going to have to clone that. It doesn't matter. We only do this like once. Um, it's not efficient to do that, but it makes the programming model a lot cleaner. Um, so fragment non terminal options. That's going to then, if the options length is greater than zero, assert that the options length is greater than zero. In this case, uh, if the option length is one, then we're going to replace it uh, by doing a um, self dot fragments index is equal to this. And I hope that is fine with lifetime. So we're going to have to get rid of this to replace. Uh, here we have a loop. That's going to infinitely loop. That's fine. Um, next attempt. So to replace this, comment this off. Um, for option and options. Whoa, yeah, this. <laughs> okay. Uh, this. Okay. So that infinitely loops, and we're going to say uh, while changed, changed is equal to true. Uh, let mute change, changed is equal to false. And then any time that we perform a transformation, we just gonna, we're just going to set changed equal to true. OK, cool. So that's working now. Uh, then, so that's going to replace the fragment with its child. Okay, and then in this case, if a fragment is a NOP, so in this case, this will be a the same as this. Um, uh, replace this expression with a NOP, and we're going to do self fragments, and then in this case, this will be fragment NOP. Um, and then in this case, we're going to do the same thing, uh, but instead, this is going to be expert zero dot clone. Okay, so shouldn't have a NOP at compile time. We have a lot of things with NOPs in them. And so I'm going to go and say, 
um, if the um, so it's at this point that I print that I have not. So I'm gonna do um, self dot fragments index dot retain. Um, if let uh, fragment non terminal. If we're gonna get uh, nt is equal to this, and this is gonna be options. So we're gonna shadow options, and then we're gonna say options dot retain uh, things where this returns true, and in this case, this is not equal to fragment nop. Okay. Um, fragment ID and okay. Uh, fragment ID nop. What do I want to do for this? If ooh, I don't know if I can do this. Um, we would have to restructure some code. Um, it protects the page so it is not executable. So my kernel driver gets an exception, and then you hook it based on that. You execute a copy of the code. That will never modify the code, but it can run. Oh, that's really cool. Um, what it, what is your goal? Are you trying to are you trying to monetize it or or do something with it? Um, I've heard of that technique before. There is a name for it. Um, fragment ID. So I'm gonna go through fragment IDs, and I need to know what fragment IDs are. Nops. Um, let mute uh, nop. Fragments is equal to a hash map or a B tree map. New. When I make something a nop, I'm going to insert it into not fragments by the index. Um, this can be a B tree set, not fragments. B tree set. Get the not fragments. This is going to track which ones are currently nops. We're going to insert index into there, indicating that index is now a not fragment. Um, self dot fragments dot length. Yep. And then when something refers to if if not fragments dot contains x, if it doesn't contain x, then retain it. Um, index borrow is not implemented. Insert dot zero. Oops. Uh, if it contains x dot zero, and ref that. Uh, okay. Ref mute. Mutable reference to this. In fact, I think that ref mute is implied. Okay, shouldn't have nop at compile time. So then this on the inside will have to say changed equals true. Um, so we're going to say if not not fragments changed is true, um, true, else false. Uh, oh, retain false. Uh, otherwise true. So I'll remove um, print. We'll put a print removing dead fragments. This from this options and then x.0, uh, x.0 and options. So removing a dead fragment, uh, yeah, it kind of doesn't like that. That's fair. Moving dead fragment that. Okay. So, wow, that's a lot of dead stuff getting removed. Um,. If it contains x0, or if it doesn't contain x0, if it does contain x0, change is true. Okay. So if not fragments contains x0, print, this one should be better. Removed this x. Okay, that's better. And this should say uh, print now a nop 
this index. So 30 it is a not removed, removed, 267, 276. Okay, sweet, looks great. So then I wanna do the same thing down here. So if the expression is, if the length is zero, replace it with a nop. Um, then, now a nop, then we're gonna go into a fragment expression. Uh, expressions, uh, same thing. Shouldn't have a nop at compile time, okay. Uh, that's because it's gonna go through, um, we're just gonna do nothing in that case. Uh, we'll do like program plus equals format panic um, unreachable or unreachable. So we're going to, if somehow we ever execute a function that is a not function, um, then we're gonna panic. Uh, access violation, oh shit, we probably can't do a panic. That's just probably gonna cause issues. Oh boy. R13 plus R14. Holy shit. That generated a lot of data. Um, function cannot return without recursing. Okay, so we have some issues here. There's some logic that we implemented incorrectly with this. Um, change is true. Retain, so if I get rid of these, This, do I still have that issue? No. If I do this, nope. And then in this case, if it contains x at zero, change is true, false, true. Okay, so somehow, uh, fragment 40 calls fragment 40 recursively. Um, I'd love to monetize it. Do you think I can? It's kind of hard to monetize techniques. Uh, that's where it's kind of difficult. Uh, something called Shadow Walker. Um, I don't know if there's going to be a great way to monetize something like that. I think you're, I think that's going to be really difficult. Um, what if I do this? Uh, Okay, so somehow nops will only occur if an expression length is zero, then the expression will go away and it will become a nop. Nop fragments, I will say that this is now a nop and convert it and say changed. In the case of a nop, there's nothing I have to do. And then in here, I'm going to say if, I'm gonna go through all of the options and if any of the things, any of the options are a nop, then I'm going to remove them as an option. That's not necessarily what I want. Um, I think I only want this in the expression case because if I remove it as an option, it will do nothing in that case. Um, and that's not what I want. So expression length is zero. Uh, fragments index is nop, now a nop. There are just a couple things that are nops, and then any expression that has a nop in it, uh, we don't have to call it. But in the case of a non-terminal, we actually want to be able to invoke a nop uh, if it does nothing. And the nop function will have an empty body. Um, and that should hopefully get inlined because there's no assembly in that case. Um, now a nop, that. So those things are nops. And what I want is I wanna put an int three anywhere in here. This'll do. And I wanna take a look at the fragments that have been turned into nops. So you fragment 38, ret. Yep, there's the real drop in place, 267, um, 276, K, 333. Yeah, all of those have turned into just an empty ret. Now, the problem is that there are probably things that are going to refer to them based on the um, 
I mean, I guess... Yeah, I mean, I want a chance of doing nothing. So I think this is the best that I can do for that optimization pass. So that was a slight improvement. Um, but the problem is, I'm guessing we're still going to have issues because we're doing lookups. Um, we can't remove NOPs uh, from dispatch. I mean, I guess I could... I could have them not call a function. So in the case of a NOP, I could make them somehow aware of that. Um, maybe down here where I go to, uh, I don't know. I don't think this is going to be a perf game, but what I can do is I can know what fragments are NOPs. And when I go to emit the table, when I go do this, I can say um, if uh, if self dot fragments uh, option dot zero is equal to fragment nop continue. So that's going to remove it from the tables. Um, yep, and then that's going to have that issue there. So yeah. So there are a bunch of things that dispatch to kind of an empty uh, case there. Um, so what do I want to do about that? If it's a NOP, then I could potentially put a null pointer in there instead, question mark. So there I'm going to put uh, otherwise table plus equals this. And in this case, I can do a table plus equals format. Uh, uh, I can just put uh, standard pointer null. I might not like that. We'll see. OK, expected a function pointer um, as, uh, as fn, as unsafe fn. Um, primitive cast, constant that as unsafe function. Uh, yep. Uh, hmm. 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 Not primitive cast. So I could potentially remove these. It's not fair. It's not correct. Because in some situations, we want an option to do nothing. Um, like in the case of this expression, there's a chance to do nothing. So I could put a null in there. Um, zero as mute u8 as fn. I don't think that's valid. Russ does some, like, dumb shit here. I can do this as a... as an unsafe fn pointer, and then deref it. Uh, const. Okay, and then I have to deref that. That has to go in an unsafe block. Uh, dereferencing raw pointers and statics is unstable. Son of a bitch, I just want to put a zero in there. I just want to put a zero in there. Um, I could do none. And this could be a sum. And then this will be an option. That should do it. Crash. Jump to null. Perfect. So what I could do here is I could say a um, 
test this with or compare this with zero. Um, three. Uh, jump if equal to three f. I'm just curious if I optimize out those things. Um, forward pointer. So I think this is going to slow it down because it's going to perform that operation every time. Here I can do a move into, I'm going to move into racks. At this point should be fine. RBX plus racks times eight. Uh, then I'm going to do a test racks racks. Uh, jump if it's equal to three F, otherwise call uh, racks. I think this is ultimately going to be slower because we're, we're doing a compare and a branch every time. We're no longer calling NOP functions. We're just kind of discarding them. Um, I think that slowed us down, didn't it? I think, I think we did. I think that broke it. Well, it didn't break it, but it slowed it down. So here I'm gonna say, what if I do a conditional move? Um, hmm. Um, what if I do, I think this is slower, isn't it? What were we getting before? Probably should have looked into that. Looks like we're getting like 32 now. Um, hmm. And before, if I just do a call direct on this, get rid of this shit. Put this to a sum for all values. I think this is... Holy shit. Did that make it better? That... I mean, it's it's so close. It it's not worth the um, extra complication, uh, extra complexity, I guess. So we're gonna say this is just a function. Okay. So call that, but we don't know if we want to do nothing until we, uh, we don't know that we want to do nothing until we generate that random number. So. Um. Huh. I could do test racks racks. Um, I could do an XOR of like R C X R C X, and I could do a conditional move if zero into racks of. Move RBX this, RBX, call racks. Mm, that did not help. That made it worse. Conditional move if zero. X of that. Move RBX into racks, call racks. So speculation can't go across uh, uh, condition, uh, C move instruction boundary. So I was curious if this would cause it to be a little bit better about that call, and it doesn't seem to be. Let's see if I do the deref into a register first. That shouldn't have an effect. Um, this shouldn't be faster than calling directly. Uh, that would be really weird if it is. It's, it's the same. So if we call this directly, you can't do rip rel plus uh, an, an offset, so I can't combine that into one instruction. Um, 
Uh, if I, if I hurt the RNG, what happens here? I mean, we can try the RNG buffer. Let's try that. So we'll do uh, R11 RNG index and R10 is RNG buffer. And we'll pass in uh, R10. And this is going to be the RNG buffer. RNG index will XOR out. So XOR R11 R11. Just going to make sure that we have that as a clobber. RNG buffer that's passed in. That doesn't get clobbered. So I'm going to generate an RNG buffer. RNG buffer. Uh, for, or we're going to do RNG buffer dot uh, iter mute dot for each x x uh, dref x is equal to This is U8. This is really bad, but uh, uh, that's fine. I just want to see. Okay, call down safe function. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. And extra curlies. Okay. We're going to allocate 32 megs worth of that. Every time we start, we're going to start with a. Um, I guess I just want to mod. By 32 megs so I actually don't want RNG buffer to get reset I want RNG index to go into this uh, equals R11 RNG index and it's also going to be passed in into R11 RNG index and this will be let mute RNG index is equal to 0 u64 and this will give me an ability to see um, how many random numbers I'm using. So right now, zero, of course, because we're not using that yet. Uh, we pass it in. That looks good. And then um, I'm going to temporarily, I'm going to say uh, increment R11. That's our RNG index. Okay, so... Uh, what did I change there? Didn't I remove a line somewhere in there? I did not. Okay, I didn't get to it yet. Oof. There we go. Uh, R12 and R14 get clobbered. R11 in and out. Perfect. Okay, so this is the number of random numbers we're generating. Um, and we're going to just put this here in our print. And we're going to say random numbers per second as F64 divided by um, elapsed. So this will tell us how many random number gener random numbers we're generating per second. Uh, 154 million per second. Woo! Okay, that might be our bottleneck, potentially... Although, ah, uh, maybe. Okay, so now I can do RNG index, inc R11. We're going to and R11 with uh, 32 times 1024 times 1024 minus 1. So now that will never, that RNG index will, um, it'll kind of be jumping all over the place because this RNG index here will never exceed um, the random thing. Here, instead of that, we're going to do this. And we're actually going to make this... Uh, we'll just leave them as quad verbs for now. And then I will do a move. After that's done, I'm going to do a move. Of, I'm, I'm going to do an add R11 with 1. I'm going to move DREF R10 plus R11 times 8 into R15. And that's going to be our random number.
that might be because it's doing the same thing every time, and that's causing it to uh, maybe not be super effective. Um, mm, mm, I think R11 one, and it with that. Um, let's see what that index is. We're not resetting that, are we? Uh, before we execute print RNG index. I don't know why we're getting the same value every time. Um, whoops, this, this. Okay. RNG buffer intermute for each RDTSC. RNG index. So we should be getting uh, different results, I think. Yeah, we should be seeing, like, if I end with zero, we should be seeing different things get produced. No, we always see the same one. Uh, why would that be happening? R11 here. Uh, let me int three this, and maybe it's because the random numbers are really bad because I'm just using RDTSC. Um, uh, uh, we'll do U DBR ten plus R eleven times eight. That's zeros. What? 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 Intermute for each, assign it 41. I'm doing something stupid, I think as pointer maybe i don't want an as mute pointer maybe if i just do this uh dbr10 with capacity doesn't set the length thank you thank you um thank you very much vec this okay so we're gonna go back thank you uh this there we go. DBR10. Yeah, they're they're terrible random numbers. Um, but let's see what happens now. Uh, we'll keep that around and get rid of the int three. Okay, we're getting different things. There's they kind of repeat. Um but if I put this to zero, I think we will be seeing random uh, inside. Okay, um, let me, let's do better random here. Um, uh, let's do, um, I need to, I need to make a better RNG. Um, RDTSC, I think RD Rand is kind of annoying to do, um, because it like it outputs I think to a register, RD Rand sixty four step, that outputs that and then returns one if it was generated zero otherwise, um, so I guess I can do this, RD Rand step into X. Um, and then I want to assert that this is not equal to zero, right? One, if it was generated. So we want to make sure just in case this might take a while. Okay. And then we print that, uh, really, let's see if those values look random. 
it takes a long time to generate that with already ran already ran is just really slow uh that looks very random okay so i'm happy with that why is that So we're seeing the same value over and over, but we should have a different RNG index, which should then cause us to use different values. Um, well, printing RNG index changes it. Um, holy shit, really? Like, that looks good. It looks like we're getting random outputs. If I do this, it goes away. And that is, it must be because it doesn't see uh, no one else is using it. I have to, I have to use that. Um, it's getting optimized out. So if I print it here, I think it's fine. It might get optimized out on the inside as well. I'm a little concerned about that. I think we're printing too much. Oh, wow. Okay. That's because we just have too many random numbers. We're going to do U8. And we're going to do... Um, we're going to make 64K worth of random numbers. Um, I don't think there's an already rand 8 step. There is not. We'll go... I guess we'll do 16s for now. This is now 128K. Um, of course, that's out of bounds. Uh, 64 down here. This will be 64 times this. This is now a move ZX uh, word pointer um, times 2. Okay. Wow. Is that, oh, that's broken. Something's not right there. Um, in 3. Uh, DBR11, DBR10. That's random. DBR10, DBR11. Okay, so that is... Should be working. Uh, is it because... Oh, because we do this IMOL here. I need to do a, a shift rate by 16 for this to be correct. Okay. Yeah, that didn't really improve perf. Um, we can go to byte level. Uh, we can say byte pointer this. Uh, and we can just not multiply. Uh, this is fine. Uh, this needs to be shift by 8. Yep. So this is no faster, and it would require us to regenerate that uh, uh, random database. I, I don't think, yeah. It's not good. Bye. Bye-bye. It's just not, uh, you're not really getting anything out of that. Um, RNG index here, RNG buffer, and RNG index here. Uh, RNG seed, okay. Of course, we got some access violations here. This needs to be 32. Okay, and we're back to 32. Um, and we don't have to reset the RNG. Uh, the RNG is just like permanently always good. Um, RNG seed. Oh, we just like leave some random shit in R15, don't we? Oh, RDTSE. So we reseed it every time. That might be kind of hurting us. I don't want to do set len. I want to only do that when I look at it. Generated plus equals offsets. The internal side, we're calling that fragments. Um, 
that goes for bytes. If we're only generating a couple bytes, this RDTSC might be hurting us. So if I do this, um, do 64. Okay, that's when it's always doing the same thing. Uh, put another F in there just to see what we get for perf. Yeah, two, 240, 250 per second. Um, I mean, arguably, is this what they're doing in their benchmark? Are they... If the seed is the same, then... Because their code gen is much worse than mine. And maybe for some reason it just doesn't happen to matter. Um, but this is always seeded the same way. And if it's always seeded the same way, I don't know if it's fair to average 35. Um, and if I did 100... Because I don't think they regenerate the random numbers. I think they use like the same seed. In which case, I don't know how fair that is. Um, F1 fuzzer. Uh, already uh, TSC here. Okay, so let me keep... Let me just persist the seed. So the seed will pass in here. And we'll we'll just let it get clobbered. So we'll do let mute, let seed is equal to ox leet 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 leet. That should just cause it to get loaded. Uh, U64. That should just cause it to get loaded once into R15. Um, seed. That's probably loading at constant. So I might have to have it come back out. R15, seed. I'm going to have the same issues before, I think. Is this just taking a little longer? Let's get rid of an F. Okay, that's back up to the, like, 32. Okay, so calling the RD Rand wasn't really hurting us. Um... Actually, that, by not, by continuing that seed, maybe the seed's just bad. Um, CMD, Python, import, random, hex, random, dot, rand, int, 0, 2 to the 64, minus 1. That's going to be our seed. We'll start with that. And that should just keep the seed around forever in R15. And I don't know if I need to print that for it to have a dependency. Uh, yep. A couple more curlies. Huh. Okay. Okay. Um, so I guess we're not bottlenecking on the RNG at all. We're bottlenecking on... Because if we gave the same seed every time, if we did this, uh, and said it's a U64, I think this is the performance that is achievable if we got rid of uh, prediction issues. It, it is literally about a 4x. Um, ah, man. How could you get rid of those predicts?
So what do they do when they run out of seeds in their stuff? Rand region pointer. Rand region pointer. Rand cursor. If it's greater than that, Rand cursor is equal to that. So it resets it. So it... So basically, it loops around the random region. I just don't... Always inline map. External ran P. Initialize random. So here, uh, it increments the random region pointer. Multiplies by that. They're not bounds checking, they're random. Rand region. So that's the calling convention. It's converting that. It's setting up its like custom regions. It then deref's R12 into R14 as the Rand region. Then calls gen start zero, um, and then it updates rand region with R14. How does that not go out of bounds? Um, if we do this, Python average make make uh okay, so that's built. Um, if I build that with ASAN, what happens? Um, oh, uh, ASAN's not going to work here because they're, um, yeah, ASAN's not going to work in that case because they're, uh, they're, impl they're writing their own assembly. So ASAN's not actually going to catch. I think that is definitely going to go out of bounds. Um, unless I miss something, but... I don't think that's really fair then. You're not using a random number generation. You're, you're just using the same values over and over again. Like, you generate the random region. It did 64k bytes worth of random. Um, by default, because it was 16. So if I do like this, uh, what happens here? Vim, uh, F1... Uh, if I do a read elf, elf buzzer, a read elf object dump, g fuzzer, uh, is this, uh, there's no h. I'm going to look for the dwarf. I want to look at the symbols. T. Uh, grep. Rand region P. Uh, so I want to like sort. Oops, not grep, sort. Sort. Rand region. Init P. And that has, yeah, that's the massive amount of data. So if I were to make that smaller, right? If I go into this, Rand region size. Uh, 
and region init p. Oh, there's another one here. Uh, eight make. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. Um, so what is that generating? It's just generating, the, okay. So it runs out of RNG and, okay. Let's see what happens here. Yeah. It just goes out of bounds. It's not like Yep. This Yeah, here it's crashing on a DRF of R13 because uh R13 in this case is just out of bounds and it's yeah, so it just goes out of bounds. So I don't know. It's kind of hard to compare against something that's like not actually producing random for the um, like right amount of time or bounds checking. Like it's. Ah. Uh, it's really hard to compare. Check if we're out of depth. Uh, depth looks good. Increment or decrement depth. We're losing a lot on the depth stuff. How do we make that better? Test R12, R12. If it's zero, jump there. I don't know. Hmm. Not 12 call fragments. These. Those should get inlined. So Rush should be inlining those. Um, I think getting rid of the calls is is like the only the only move. And I'd have to think that through. I mean, I'm pretty happy with this. Like, it, it works pretty well. Um, what are we using? Are we using JSON? JSON over here. Make. Um, let's go. Like, I don't think it's fair that their random number generation is not part of their uh, cost. Right, because they do it outside, they do it once, they don't bounce check, and they don't re regenerate. Um, so in this case, make, yep. Average up pi. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, oh, that's because I set the, the, that makes sense. So if I do... F on fuzzer, uh, make this like 28, so a big number, do this, yep, that's what I would expect, F1 fuzzer, okay, so that generates a shit ton of random numbers, Um, and what am I using? Am I using the JSON? JSON, JSON. Okay, good. Uh, okay. We got that. Vim. Uh, fuzz, fuzz dot s. So these are like the generate the digits. Check if the max depth is breached. Um do the random and then call. That's effectively the, the same thing that I'm doing. Um, um, I 
I haven't. Uh, yeah, the both of these are bottlenecking on branch predictions, and I think that's there's really nothing more that we can do in either of these implementations. Even the like generate this white space that's going to go to the ws prints, and then that's going to go to ws prints, um, which is the uh, vm ops. WS prints, this is like the table that's going to call like print uh, 119. Um, and okay, so like that's a ret, so it will do all these things. This is very similar to what we're doing now. Um, although for things like false, uh, we're actually emitting just two stores and we're not doing inks every time. Um, but I don't think that has, and then this is all their, their tables, the quad. Um, gen characters. So these are the decisions. And I guess those aren't... The decisions aren't getting inlined in mine. How many, how many of these have one decision? Or I think I optimized that out, right? If there is only one... If there's only one, then go to a direct use. So down here, that does a dispatch to a function based on the table. Um, however, that doesn't allow me to inline those calls. I need to inline these calls. Because these are going to be really short calls. And they're going to be really frequent. Um, what are we going to do? U, uh, d, uh, d, or disassemble rbx plus racks times 8, uh, ploy that. Okay, so we're about to just call a ret. If I inline that, that would be huge. If I inline that, that would be huge. But do I need to call? If I inline everything, is that going to be too much? So here we are again. That it's going to, that one's fine. See, like this, I don't like. This is this is the issue that I have. Is I don't want to, I don't want to invoke something that just does a, a move D. Um, although I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, I mean, the last version that we had that was pure Rust would have had those inlined, and we weren't getting much better performance. Although there were some inefficiencies there that we kind of got rid of. Um, Uh, this is the issue right here. I want to inline the assembly that I want to generate for fragments. I think all terminals I want to get inlined. Because that call ret is just really expensive. Um, and the ret's going to screw up predictors. Um, there's got to be a better way. I actually want to see what this looks like in Ida quick before I make any crazy decisions. We're going to grab these, throw them into Ida, see what happens. Um... I'm curious what this code gen looks like. Uh, main, test main. Okay, that's going to go into here. Instant now. Okay, here's, here's the hot loop. We're going to call fragment. 
we're going to see if we should break out of this loop. This is the hot loop where we call this fragment. So this is the root fragment. And in here, we're going to see if we should skip this. We're going to see if we should skip this. We could optimize it to not have a branch on each one of these. Uh, branch around. Uh, trap to be bugger, obviously. So dispatch 243. There are a couple uh, things. So we have this drop. That's a ret. And then we have this, um, which is another one. So this code gen looks kind of exactly what I would expect. Uh, in fact, there are pretty much no memory accesses in this whole thing. Um, and I really like that. Uh, I think... Hmm. Can I make this jump based instead of ret based? I think so. I think I want to do jumps and have those chained together. And I want to get rid of calls. How do I implement that? The call rets are killing me. And you might be thinking like, oh, the, the rets probably aren't that big of a deal. Well, when you look in VTune, if it loads, it doesn't seem too happy right now. Come on, VTune. Do your thing. All right. See ya. Oh, and there it goes. VTune. Okay, hopefully this is everything set up the same way it is. Good. Ah, yeah, we got the break. Bah, 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 Int 3. Okay, go away. Okay. That's fine, right? Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, that's not a real one. This, run it. Looks good, close. And I think we're spending a significant amount of CPU time in that empty function. 52% bad speculation. Unreal. Now we're not bottlenecking on memory accesses anymore. Um, that is completely gone. It's really just uh, speculation. Um, yeah, memory bound? N not at all. Like, we're not doing, like, any... We're not doing like almost any uh, memory operations anymore because we got rid of all of them, except for the DRF of the tables and the rets and the calls, obviously that push. Um, here we can see that it's a very small amount of instructions retired, but a large amount of clock ticks. And I wanna see that as a fractional um, source file mod.rs, start address there, back end bound, retiring. Um, what is this column? What is retiring? Um, I want, uh, Shoda as, okay. Clock ticks. This is the only thing I care about, clock ticks. Show data as, uh, percent, percent. 11% of my CPU time is spent in just a ret. 24% of my time is spent in this. Let's take a look. Yeah, we're losing a lot of time on this test R12. 
a uh, small amount on this. That one's not too bad. Do you think it's possible to contrive a program that fails branch prediction on every branch? Um, I think so. Yeah, that should be possible. Bottom up, drop in place. Drop in place. What's this fragment? For a specific CPU, yeah. There we got our RNGs. I guess. Let's see what I can do by getting rid of uh these branches, these check if we're out of depth. Um, I think I can do that once at the start. So I'm going to do, I'm going to emit that for, wait, that's non-terminal. That's going to look it up. Oh, but that can get inlined. I see. Yep, that's okay. So we don't really have any say there. I guess maybe on the other calls. That's going to call to here. That's going to unwind it up. What if we change up our depth? I just want to see. Uh, if we go to like 128 depth, I just want to see how that affects our performance. Got to get rid of some Fs. Oh boy, those are huge now. Wow. I guess these are massive. Uh, can't infer type for T, I guess, yeah. That is a big input, uh, 64. Okay. See how this looks. Just gotta wait for that print. Maybe I put too many Fs. I don't think so. 32, 93 megs a second in this situation. Okay. What if I go down to like eight, something like really small? What do we got here? 86, 88, 90 a second. Okay, so I think we're pretty much comparable to them on that. Let's check out their... Um, JSON. Wait. Wait. We're outperforming their JSON stuff. I guess uh, at depth equals eight, we're slaughtering it. What? And depth equals 32, that's 10 megs a second. So if we do depth 32, I mean, I guess we have that benchmark up. I don't know. Yeah, we're it's nine times faster than that. Um, HTML, that's their fastest one, running 200 megs a second. Let's see what we got. We haven't tried HTML in a while, and HTML. Let's see what we get. Two hundred twenty five megs a second. Okay. That's about the same. Oh, that's uh depth equals ah, it's about the same. Depth one twenty eight, depth thirty two. Um 
If we go to depth 128, what do we get here? Two twenty two. And if I go to depth eight, apparently there's this really fast there. Oh wow. Yeah, okay. Depth eight is really fast. Three hundred and twenty megs a second. Uh okay. SCP test dot uh or gvim html dot json. I'm just gonna take this and try it out on theirs with depth eight. Uh, vim HTML dot JSON. Vim make HTML make. Wow, it takes a lot longer. <laughs> Python! <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. I mean, I can generate the... It takes... I mean, I'm basically spending all my time like i'm able to process it pretty fucking fast i mean i'm re relying on rust oh my god <laughs> is it working i think it is Holy shit. Can we include this time in the benchmark? Oh my god, come on. Is it done yet? Wake me up when it's done. So how's everyone doing today? Is it done yet? Wow. 
Wow. Come on. What are they doing? What is that possibly doing? It's using a lot of CPU. I guess I should close the the game clients I have open. They're hogging the CPU. I actually want my CPU to be like pretty idle when I'm doing this. Let's close some of this stuff out. Let's get VTune closed. All right. Oh, it's still going. World's fastest fuzzer. Depth uh, 32. Guess I'll just put that up on another screen for a, a while. 229 for that one, 128 depth. Two twenty-five. So eventually once <laughs> once we get a program built. I mean I'm just chugging along here. Write your shit in Rust, heads up. Pro tip, write your stuff in Rust. Uh, 229. Okay, so depth 8. Depth 4. What if we do depth 4? It's probably like super fast or super slow. That's pretty fast. Okay, depth 8. We can close and don't save. I just want to see what their perf is. Their perf is. Their perf is. Now, not. We don't need that print anymore. Still waiting. These inputs are kind of cool. I do like this. Doc type, HTML. Do they all start with that? Yeah, they do. Do I optimize that? If there's only one option, then it's just direct. If there is zero, it's a not. If the XML is one, um, then replace with a direct use, retain, remove any NOP from expressions, but we want to keep NOPs and non terminals because that will, uh, we need to be able to uh, invoke those. Okay. NOP. What if I put the depth check at the start of functions? What if I, let's try that. I just realized that the HTML grammar have grammar nodes for each tag being used. Otherwise it seems like their grammar files cannot support arbitrary tags. I'm not sure, let's take a look. 
Um, P tag. Looks like they kind of have these for uh, percentus. Uh, um, they just have a couple of these different ones. So they have like a lot of these, yeah, tags here under L. I think they should support arbitrary tags, although I don't know if they support fields in those tags. Uh, yeah, I don't see any fields in those tags. Oh, h1 equals. Okay, i equals. Okay, so they do have that. Um, yeah, they define each tag. Yep. It's, uh... Still going here. We're still waiting on it. Fastest fuzzer in the world. This has no depth cap. Yeah. So this just goes until it stalls. Yeah, this is not necessarily the way that I would design a generative fuzzer, but I wanted to use the exact same inputs they're using so we could do some apples to apples. And ultimately, the conclusion is the paper is pretty good. I, I mean, they have a good focus on optimization. I wouldn't claim that it's the world's fastest fuzzer when it can be rewritten from scratch in two hours of time. Um, like, it's just... It's a good paper, but don't make those claims. Like, it's this is nothing new to me. Like, yeah, I like the I like the way that they did the RNG here. Um, but this is nothing. This to me, this is is nothing new. This is pretty standard. In fact, this is 350 lines of code of some pretty easy Rust. Um. Like, we could probably do this in a more efficient manner so it doesn't take up as much space. Uh, the initial version that we did that generated pure Rust, that was all safe code. Um, that one uh, was basically the same in performance as theirs. And it's just, why do it in assembly? Why make it Linux specific? Why use int max as a global? Um, if you're doing things like that, you shouldn't be claiming world first, world's best, um, cause it's, it's just hacky. It's just really hacky. I'm not saying that the paper isn't good. I, I think the paper's good. The numbers, it seems like I'm pretty much on par. I mean, I have no idea why it's taking so long for this to generate. Like, I don't know if this is ever going to finish. Um, I can't imagine how long they wait for that. Um, I don't use any globals, so I'm able to run this with multiple threads. Uh, it scales out just fine. Um, and the way that we're doing this with assembly is, is so fucking overkill. We were able to get very close to this using purely safe Rust. That was using vectors that were dynamically growing, so you could have arbitrary size inputs. And RNG that doesn't go out of bounds when it runs out of uh, uh, random numbers. Um, and that's my biggest complaint, is that the same thing can be done in 250 lines of code without many of the limitations that theirs has and to get the exact same performance. In fact, get features that they don't have. I, I know I don't have the like resolving things down to the concrete thing at the end, but that's not, that's not going to affect performance. And it's like maybe 30 lines of code. Like it would look very similar to optimize. I would like go in, I would try and find the fastest path and then I'd... <coughs> pick the fastest path once the depth exhaustion occurs. Um, so, and I don't even know if they're, are they even doing that? Um, F1, FIM, F1, fuzzer. Um, still waiting on that Python. 
So first of all, their random number generation is not part of their performance benchmark. Their benchmark does not include that uh, since, well, I guess I put the, I put the RDTSC, I put the benchmark in there. Um, they only generate 64K and then, I, this is just so much here. It's so much. It's so much. And we have the exact same performance and none of the, the issues. And we can immediately parse a, a JSON file. And it's, it's a, a, a quarter of the amount of code. Um, elegance is important in, in code. Um, their code gen also leaves a lot of room to be desired uh, for things like the, um, like I showed before. Obviously, it's not a big issue because everything's bottlenecking entirely on the um, generation. But yeah, it's just... I don't think this is the sort of thing you should claim uh, fastest in the world on. I just don't. Um, so, I don't know. It's cool research. Big fan. Like, I, I really like it. I like pushing that direction of, of performance. Uh, I like saying that uh, grammar fuzzers out there are very slow. I don't like comparing yourself to dev you random and saying that you're faster than dev you random when that means nothing. First of all, your debut random wasn't off by an order of magnitude. Second of all, you use an RNG that is 100 times faster than your debut random. And so it's not really fair uh, when you're making comparisons like that. And when I see comparisons like that, I just assume that you're probably not actually interested in the maximum performance. You're interested in sounding like you've done the coolest thing. I'm sorry. Uh, 1,200 lines of code in Python that emits code that basically repeats like writing bytes in a loop and goes out of bounds in 50 places and allocates uh, 8 gigabytes worth of BSS section in your, in your uh, program. I realize it's a proof of concept, uh, and the concept is really cool. I re-implemented the concept, and, I, and, I, and it's good. I might even eventually use something like this. Um, but this is just kind of standard, right? A, a lot of people do this sort of stuff. This is nothing too crazy, nothing too new. Um, and I think where you have a lot of room for uh, making claims is like if you make it run with multiple threads. Uh, this will not. This uses globals. When it has globals all over the place, it will not run with multiple threads. Mine doesn't use globals, so I can, I can run as many threads as I want. And this throughput will be this multiplied by the number of cores that I have. Um, and I did it in safe rust. Obviously, this one is not that anymore. The safe rust was basically comparable to what they had, but you could do arbitrary sized uh, outputs. You didn't have to be constrained. You, it didn't go out of bounds when it ran out of space. Uh, the stack limitation, like everything was safe. It generated a, a safe rust application uh, that would work in any context. Um, so let's see, git status, git commit am, um, uh, probably final uh, assembly version. Okay, git log, uh, git checkout, uh, maybe this Rust generator. Okay, so this one, did this have unsafe? Uh, technically, I don't need that seed, and it had unsafe on the seed here. Uh, oops. Okay, so there's no unsafe code in this, and this is the one that we kind of went with, and this produced uh, a test.rs, so let's see. Here we go. Uh, there we're getting 60 megs a second on JSON. Uh, did we have a depth? Yeah, we did. So here, depth eight, we're gonna go to HTTP or HTML. And here we go. This is in pure Rust. 
uh, with no, I think we're doing extend from slice. Yeah. Um, it's actually faster. It's actually faster than the assembly version. So in pure Rust, using extend from slice, no unsafe, using a structure that kind of constrains it to a specific like class kind of environment, we're able to get, um, I guess I want to do release here. Uh, there we go. So, and here we go. It generates a, a Rust application that does the exact same thing. Uh, it's faster by almost a factor of two. It's completely safe. It's thread safe. Um, oh, yeah. And this is what it produced. It created this fuzzer. It goes through. It's going to call this fragment in a loop. It's going to update the generated. It's going to print on this interval. And then here we see like the seeds, all of the calls, and Rust is going to be able to op optimize all of this out in inline things. And this actually outperforms our assembly version. Um, and I'm not too surprised. And everything in here has extended from slice, so we handle arbitrary size outputs. Um, so if I did, uh, if I did, so here's what I can do. Um, we had some optimizations in the latest one, that NOP stuff. I think we're going to probably want to pull that in. Um, but here we're just generating that, printing it out. Um, we can get rid of this. We can get rid of um, new seed rand allocate fragment optimize program generate. We can get rid of this. There you go. So here we have, uh, and we could actually have Rust try to optimize it a little bit more potentially. Um, let's see if we can get uh, C LTO equals uh, fat, um, and then C target CPU equals native. And there you go. Now it's 450 megs a second. And we didn't have to tweak at 470 megs a second. And this is html.json. Um, if we look at their, uh, it kind of dropped down there. Maybe it's because I opened Firefox. Now it's building it again, blah, blah, blah. We're really bottlenecking on, on Rust C there. Yeah, it's about 450. Once again, still waiting. LTO in a single file. Technically, I think it will get me some things uh, like extend from slice, and some of those might might be affected. Um, so if we take a look at building fast fuzzer, so let's look at their perf numbers. So okay. Once again, good paper. Big fan. Um, just the execution is kind of sloppy. All right, so what do they claim? HTML, depth equals eight. That's what we're currently running. They're getting 200 megs a second, and we are getting... We all know the number. We ran it like four times. About 460. So it's almost two and a half times faster in this specific case. Um, it's entirely safe. There is no code in here that's not thread safe. There's no undefined behaviors. There's no globals that are massive. In fact, if we look, uh, it produced a 230k, uh, 238k executable. Um, and everything was self-contained in a clean way that we could just spin up multiple of those if we needed to. Um, let's get some, let's get that NOP optimization implemented. Uh, okay. Whoa. Uh, seed. We don't need this. We don't need instance. We can clean that up. Uh, I don't know if we use serialize. Uh, 105. We don't use rand anymore. And we don't need seed. And cell we're not using now. And look up fragments. 105. 
Um, we don't need to mark these inline. Uh, that's not used at all. Uh, look up a fragment based on the fragment identifier. How many places do I use this? I could maybe get rid of this function. One spot. All right. Bye. Here you go. Uh, fragment is mute. Uh, fragments this dot zero. Gone. Okay. Allocate a new fragment identifier and add it to the fragment list. Okay. Sweet. Still waiting. Um, this is going to be optimize to remove uh, frag fragments with no options. Or, hey, it completed. Look at that. <laughs> Average.py. Now we can get an apples to apples test. Um, depth eight, average dot pi. Oh no. Oh shit. I, yep. Oh, we gotta wait again. Are we gonna do a time on make? I forgot. I need to, I need to remove from this. I need to remove the invocation of make because I, I didn't realize that that was going to be really expensive. So here we go again. <laughs> Did it, uh, yeah, it did delete the binary. Um, oh, it didn't delete the binary, actually. Um, we have the, we have the binary, we, we deleted the, um, uh, C files. So, python average.py. Okay, average 8.1. Um, let's switch this over to, uh... Oh, I will need to regenerate it if I want to change that stat. So I guess I can change my stats. Um, I'm just going to get that going. And... Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can't, like, rapidly prototype or change things in there. But um, I actually control seed that. I have that canceled. Uh, we're going we're gonna to see what we get here now that we, have, we don't have a CPU loaded up to the, to the brim. 470, 480. So about 480 megabytes per second. Uh, get status. Uh, how do I... Can I commit this now? Um, switched back to Rust version. Get log. How does that work? Oh, Jesus Christ. What did I do? Um, all right, whatever. Uh, cargo run. Okay. Cool. So, that's going to get a unique fragment identifier. Um, all right. Let's look and see if we can clean up optimize at all. So, we added the NOP. And I want to check that out. So, how do I get checkout master? Uh, oops, I made one change there. Git log. Okay, and we just want to take a look. We're going to steal the optimize from this. Okay. And then git log, git checkout. How do I go back to uh, this? I guess I can do git checkout of this. Git log. Yep, sweet. Okay. E. Uh, optimize. So we're going to replace this with this function. Oh my god. Son of a bitch. Not fragments. Okay, here we go. Yes. Go all the way forward. Here we go. Um... As you'll have noticed, I'm not very good at Git. Mainly because I, I don't work on many things that require complex uh, Git. We'll just have a NOP here. 
Okay, and then fragment 214, nop not covered. Uh, fragment nop. Oh, check this one out. Boom, done. Okay, so now this has the nop removal. Um, did that hurt performance? Or am I just getting unlucky here? Depth is eight. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that made it better. 500 megs a second. All right. So optimize. Uh, keeps track of fragment identifiers, which are uh, which resolve to nops. Um, uh, track if a change, uh, oops, if a change, uh, if an optimization had an effect, start off assuming no effect, effect from optimization, um, go through each fragment looking for potential optimizations. Uh, clone, uh, clone the fragment such that we can inspect it, but we also can mutate it in place. Um, okay. Uh, there should never be a non-terminal with no options. Uh, and then in this case, uh, actually, that is technically fine. So... If this non-terminal only has one option, replace itself with the uh, only option it resolves to. Okay, change equals true. Fragments index is equal to that. Um, okay, then here, um, if this expression doesn't perform any operation uh, or doesn't have anything to do at all, then simply replace it with a nop. Okay, so replace it with a nop. Uh, track that this, and we'll say change is true. Uh, track that this uh, fragment identifier now, it, uh, now resolves to a nop. Um, if this expression uh, only does one thing, then replace the expression with uh, the thing that it does. Okay, boom. Okay, then this is if an operation or if a fragment, if a fragment. Uh, if, if uh, this is just going to be remove all nops from this expression as they would as they wouldn't result in any thing occurring uh, only retain uh, fragments which are not nops Fragment was an up. Remove it. Uh, fragment was fine. Keep it. Okay. Nothing to do in the terminal case. Uh, uh, nothing to optimize out all terminal um, fragments. Uh, just are, are already... Yeah, nothing to optimize out. I think that's fine. Uh... And then nops uh, already maximally optimized. And we'll do that for this too. And we can do this. Or fragment nop. Okay. Cool. You do git ref log to see where you came from. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, so now we're running 500 megs a second. 
502 megs a second. And this is, they cite that they can get uh, 200 per second in this case, 200 megs a second. So uh, we'll want to benchmark that. Uh, I'll, I'll get this up and running again. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to switch back to JSON temporarily. And I'm just going to use this so I can benchmark, um, uh, I'm going to Python, uh, vim, vim f1 fuzzer print f here, elapsed, uh, oh, here's where I print it. So I don't want to print the output. We'll just get rid of that. Okay. Now that will print 81, the number of bytes. And I'm just going to do the, I'm just going to print the cycles. Um, cycles, colon this, uh, bytes, colon this. Elapsed and be written. Make, okay. And then we're going to do um, microseconds. LU and this kind of sucks to get these. Uh, I think I want to do um, uh, unless there's like a better syscall these days, and I don't think there is. I think I need to use uh, uh, sys get time or um, man. Fuck. Ah. Uh, shit. What is it? What is it called? Ah, oh, boy, I'm really blanking on that. Uh, get time Linux. Uh, this is called, it has like the monotonics, a uh, clock get time. Okay, so we're just gonna do this. Um, so struct time spec uh, TP, we'll do clock get time, uh, clock monotonic into uh, TP. And then down here, we're going to do the same thing. Uh, struct time spec NTP. And this will be NTP make. Okay, yep. And then we'll do. Uh, uh, I guess we'll say nanoseconds here. And then we'll do U in 64T uh, NS elapsed is equal to NTP dot. TV seconds as a long, um, uh, as a UN64T, UN64, ah, uh, UN64, UN64, ah, this multiplied by, uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, UL, uh, plus NTP.TV, uh, NSEC, I hate this shit. <laughs> okay, uh, that looks good. Minus this, where this is TP, and this is TP. Uh, NS elapsed. Okay, does that check out? Uh, no, I think that's wrong. Um, Uh, NTP, TV seconds, maybe subtract before multiplying. Um, yeah, I could do the seconds first, um, but yeah, I feel like 81 nanoseconds. Is that, I feel like that's not right. So this processor is running uh four, three, this that many divided by cycles, 8753, uh, one over this. Uh, it took about, should be about 2000 nanoseconds. Oh, I put it in the wrong print spot. Yep, thank you. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> it has elapsed. I was like, this should be about 2000. <laughs> 
And there it is. Uh, uh, 32, 35, 31, 45, 38, 34, 29, 3,000. Looks good. Um, yep. Seems to line up. Bites look good. Okay, so now I can do averaged up high. And here I can get the... Um, here I can parse... Uh, shit. That's what it looks like. Okay. Um... And I can also start this build. Uh, we're going to start this build process. Uh, and we're going to time it because it's fun. All right. So that's the format that we get. So I'm going to do uh, cycles, colon, uh, nanoseconds, colon, 0 through 9. Oops. 0 through 9 plus, uh, we don't need a dot, and then um, bytes. I think there's like a way to do digits, and I never learned it, but I, I always just do this. Okay. Oh, slash D plus. Thanks. And use R strings. What do R strings allow you to do again? Okay, float match. So this is going to be cycles, nanoseconds, bytes, uh, byte. Here, this will be, uh, I guess, count plus equals one dot, sum plus equals uh, bytes, 81 dot, uh, oops. Um, Float byte. Um, rostering no escape. Okay. That's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, print cycles, nanoseconds, byte. Um, comment this shit out temporarily as it's broken. Uh, Python average.py. Okay, that looks like that's probably working. Um, average.py, oh, that's doing, yeah, that's doing 10,000. So if I did this, average.py, okay, one. So that's single shot, bytes generated, okay. Fuck yeah. So, how do I want to keep these sums? I can do a count of that, and then I can just do, like, um, sum is equal to 0 dot, 0 dot, 0 dot. And then here I can do uh, sum. Oh, I don't know how to do maps in Python. <laughs> I have, n I literally have no idea. <laughs> We're just going to hack it. We don't need this code around for too long. But if someone has a recommendation for this, I, I'm terrible at Python, uh, as is pretty obvious. Uh, bytes. So here I can say performed percent D runs uh, this megabytes per second. So we'll have count sum 2 divided by 1024. Um, yeah. Uh, 1024 divided by 1024 divided by the, uh, nanoseconds divided by, uh, one. Can't you do ticks? Maybe not. Uh, convert it to seconds. So then we're going to, uh, sum one. Uh, okay, nice, and then we'll print, uh, I'll pretty print this a little bit, uh, we'll do like 10, there you go, okay, so, if I, so that's not really fair, because they, I mean, that is fair, that's totally fair, um, I feel like 
If it's doing one iteration, that's totally fair, because that's technically what I'm doing. But fine, we'll let it warm up. We'll give it a thousand, and there we go. We'll give it ten thousand. Um. Uh, it's a little unfair because you might be smoothing out the peak performance. So I mean, this is this is pretty much as fair as I can possibly make it. Uh, you're calculating throughput using sum. Uh, doesn't there's generate a whole buffer of random numbers? Yes, it does. It does on startup. We're giving them we're giving them the benefit of the doubt. It also goes out of bounds, and it doesn't check bounds on the output, and it doesn't check the bounds on the usage of random numbers, and it also, like, doesn't, ch like, th we're giving it about as easy of a time as we possibly can. We're giving it, it, we're only benchmarking, we're only keeping track of the hottest part of the loop. Uh, Vim F1... Uh, fuzzer. So we're only looking at, we're, we're doing like a clock get time around the hottest part of the loop. We've commented out their like, um, uh, we've commented out writing to the file. We've commented out that they uh, reset the pointer because that's not really fair because that gives it more cache locality when it's generating a big input. Um, so we're giving it pretty much the best possible scenario here. We're unrolling a shit ton, um, and we're running it in in that big loop, and we're doing what? Uh, uh, gen uh, vim average dot pi. We're doing ten thousand iterations. If we go to ten iterations in that internal loop, look at that. Perf goes right in the shitter. Um, so, yeah. Nevertheless. Here's like the best case scenario that we're given it. I think this is JSON. This is depth of eight. So we'll go to ours and we'll do JSON.json and then depth. Um, I think it will outperform it. Uh, depth uh, greater than or equal to eight, then return out depth plus one. Okay. And here we go. I think we will be slower than theirs in this case. Uh, yeah, we are. So uh, we're slower by a pretty good margin. Um, and once again, that's because we're um, we're bounds checking all of our stuff. Uh, I guess with capacity here, I could even do vec new, and it's still going to be the same. This way, it won't even allocate much. So this will use the minimum amount of RAM possible. So what is this using? Um, this is test. It's using uh, two megs of RAM. Um, and if we take a look at theirs, uh, so ours is using two megs of RAM, doesn't go out of bounds, has no unsafe code, uh, scales with threads, um, and now we can take a look. I guess I need another terminal. I think I got one here. Uh, duplicate this one. Uh, htop, um, python average.py. I guess it's going to keep exiting every time I print. Um, I don't know. It's it's not really a fair comparison. Um, so I'm curious to see once this HTML is finished generating, how it's going to uh, kind of compare. Um, 60, yeah, 62. Uh, that looks pretty good. What if I do 16 depth? Okay, looks good. 128. I think this one took a long time to compile. So process all those in sequence. Just call those as functions. Okay, 64. Yeah. Okay, looks pretty good. If the depth is greater than or equal to 8. Yeah, that's what we want. Okay, so we're a little bit slower than they are in that case. But um, we're doing this extend from slice, uh, which is safe. And it's appending. And it's like allowing that to grow to a dynamic size. Um, 
but I think we're going to outperform. Actually, uh, I mean, yeah, we're running it right here. I don't, I don't think this is fair, <laughs> to be honest. Um, if we do 100, then that's about the same. And remember, that's generating, if we do one, like we ask it to generate one input, um, it's pretty slow. And I'm curious if their RNG is not, because like in our case, right, if we break our RNG, if we make our RNG return the like same value, if we like get rid of these, um, then we end up with this, right? Um, so I'm curious if their RNG is actually performing as it should in this situation. So if I do a hundred deep, basically if it runs out of RNG, uh, we can take a look at, uh, we can't see what it's producing. Um, but there's a chance that the RNG is going out of bounds in their, uh, thing. And I might have made it, um, uh, Rand region P, uh, Rand cursor, yep, Rand region size, ooh, that's eight. Oh yeah, that's uh, 28. I think this is the one that actually gets used. Um, I can see if I can go out of bounds pretty easily. Uh, Average.py. Uh, this. Oh. Uh. Oh, that might be on the output itself. Uh, I could try it on this side. The lack of random helps the predictor too much. Yeah, so I think that that's exactly what it is. Um, 90 megs a second. I mean, quite frankly, what would you rather have? Something that goes out of bounds and crashes in a million ways or something that literally generates safe rust? There is no unsafe code in here and there's no globals. So, but I think we might outperform it on some of their other benchmarks. Uh, so for JSON, we're kind of underperforming, but we ma we matched it with our other one. I can try and s put the unsafe support back in here. Um, so this will be uh, self.buff. Um, here. So this will be with capacity one meg. And then this will go in these. We can't really optimize any of this stuff, although we could get rid of arguments. I think self.rand was giving us a problem or maybe depth. Maybe having that argument is hurting us. Um, I'm not quite sure. So here I can do, uh, what happens if I just get, well, if I get rid of that, it's gonna be a big issue. If I just make this fixed, nah, set, I'm gonna do this, unsafe, set len uh, to self.buff.len plus uh, value.len. Uh, so we need to do this. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah, we outperform it. Even in the, like, perfect uh, unrolled 10,000 times, we outperform it. So, let's, uh, 
that's just setting the length, so that's not writing the bytes, but writing the bytes is not causing a bottleneck. This extend from slice is really expensive because this is a dynamically sized vector that we would grow. Um, so what I can do is we can make this uh, correct, but still unsafe. Um, so I can do assert. Um, how do I want to write this? Well, first of all, we're start, we'll start off with this. Tab, tab. Uh, close this. And we'll pass this in. OK. So what we can do is we'll write this as unsafe code. Um, don't need the new lines. Unsafe, don't need that. And I think we got some perf by unsafe. Yep. That. Okay. Don't want a comma there either. Nice. So that's just going to set the length, and it's not actually going to do anything with it. Um, so what I can do is uh, standard mem or pointer copy non overlapping from the this dot as pointer into self dot buff uh, dot offset self dot buff dot len and we want to copy uh, value dot length bytes so this will be value value dot len and there we go um, offsets uh, as mute pointer. Okay, and then this needs to be an I size. Eighty five. Okay, so that did slow it down a little bit. Um, is it getting the length of it? Setting the length. If we get rid of this, this is just wrong now. I think, yeah, zero. So set the length of the length plus that. I think it'll be smart enough to optimize that. But we're pretty much already in their ballpark. Um, and here I can do assert, uh, or like let let new off new size is going to be equal to the existing size, and we'll do let old size is equal to this self.buff.length, and then here we'll do old size plus that, and then we'll copy um, with offset from this, and then we'll copy that many bytes. Uh, value is next, so value.len here, value, value.len, offset, copy non-overlapping, set the length to new size, and here I can do an assert that uh, new size is greater than self.buff.capacity, um, or assert that it's less than or equal to that. And now it's inbound, so it's now safe. Um, uh, I size, got you size, as I size. So old size, get the length, get the new size, make sure that the new size is less than or equal to the capacity, and this is the same as the extend from, well, extend from slice allows it to grow. Um, and so this is pretty close. So let's see. So this is at like 80 megs a second. Uh, if we get rid of this assert, we're probably at like 85 megs a second. Um, yep. And if we get rid of the copy non-overlapping, I'm curious actually with this. So this puts us at 100. 106. Um, I wonder if looking up those pointers is, is expensive. Copy non-overlapping. I don't think just writing the bytes is going to be a bottleneck. Um, self.buff.clear, are we doing that up here? Yeah, we are. 
So then here I can print the the output, and we'll just print buff, uh, fuzzer dot buff, uh, fuzzer dot buff, fuzzer dot buff. Yep. All uh, right. What? Oh yeah, default. Yep. Oh yeah, and we just want to do a string from UTF-8 lossy on this ref. Do, do, do. And there we go, we have outputs, they look solid. Okay, so those look good. And then if we set the depth higher, set it to 32, get this to run, boop, 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 generating the shit. Okay. Nice, that looks good. That looks great. Okay, so if I were to get rid of copying on overlapping, this is just gonna be wrong. It's gonna print uh, probably just random heap data. So there's just, yeah. And this assert size capacity, that's kind of expensive. Um, yeah, 110 per second. Uh, but it's wrong. Uh, and then this is kind of correct, but not quite. Because uh, that assert, and the assert brings us down a little bit more. Yeah, 85 a second. And what do we have if we just do it the, the clean way? Sixty-five, actually a pretty big hit for that. Um, that's kind of crazy. So if if the new size is greater than the capacity of the buffer, then um, I'm just like writing what extend from slice does, but I think uh, Rustvec. Uh, capacity, uh, set, shrink, set len, um, retain, resize, resize, that on safe, no, that takes a value, reserve, reserves for at least additional more elements to be inserted into the vector, collection meter reserve more to, yep, after calling reserve, It'll be greater than or equal to self.len plus additional. Uh, reserve exact. Yep. Try reserve. Try reserve exact. So reserve. Uh, so we'll do um, self.buff.reserve. We will reserve new size minus self.buff.capacity. So we'll get the, uh, if it's greater than that, then we're gonna reserve extra bytes. So this is now technically safe um, and it supports growing. So if that's expected, uh, yep, yep, curlies. Okay, so this should now be safe. And there we go, we're at 82. Uh, so I can do a, um, I can go to up here and I can do without, with capacity, I can just do new. And now it's going to only use the memory as it needs it. Perfect, and it's the same perf, no surprise. If I got rid of this, uh, that reserve, this is now unsafe and this will crash pretty hard. Yep, there it is, okay. So new size minus the old capacity reserve that much more. Um, oh, additional more elements to be inserted. Um, I guess I wanna go by old size then. Uh, if that's adding reserve more space, okay. After calling reserve, capacity will be 
greater than or equal to self.len, self.buff.len. So we're going to do new size minus old size. Uh, I don't think the capacity was actually safe there. So if the... Um, yep. So if the new size is greater than the capacity, then we're going to reserve the new size minus the old size. Um, I don't know why that's a diff. That's kind of weird. Um, uh, reserve. So self.len, after calling reserve, capacity will be greater than or equal to self.len plus additional. Does nothing if capacity is already sufficient. Um, okay. And then in this case, uh, old size, get the length, get the old size plus the new uh, amounts that we want. If the new size is greater than the capacity, if it's equal, that is fine. Then we'll reserve the new size minus the old size, and that will be guaranteed by their API. We copy from the value into the offset of old size into the buffer uh, for that many bytes, and then we set the length to um, new size. That is good. This is safe. Um, so I don't know why extend from slice is so much slower. I really don't, because this is doing the exact same thing. Um, OK, so this just completed. It took 25 minutes. It took 25 minutes. It produced 48,000 lines of assembly. All right. Uh, Average.py. Python average.py. All right. So this is the performance I'm getting at a depth of 8 for HTML. So we'll go back to HTML, and then we'll compare it. And I think we outperform it. Do, do, do. Oh, shit. Didn't we outperform it with the extend from slice? What's our depth? Depth, oh, depth eight, sorry. Woof. I was like, no fucking way. All right. Depth is eight. Here we go. <sighs> what if I do the save version for this? Even the safe version is almost twice as fast. But my unsafe version, which is still safe, it just uses unsafe code to accomplish the same thing. It is uh, actually, it's probably even printing too fast. Um, Got to add another F in there. Here we go. I think it outperforms it. <laughs> TLDR, I think it outperforms it. 1762 divided by uh, 371. We'll give it 372. It's about 4.73 times faster. Um, and it's pure rust. So, so what are some comparisons? This version is four to five times faster in a very specific scenario, but no worse than 30% slower in the worst case scenarios. It doesn't go out of bounds. It checks everything for uh, correctness. It doesn't run out of seeds and then have undefined behavior based on reading random things out of bounds on globals. 
It supports arbitrary sized inputs. It doesn't reserve four gigabytes of memory in BSS. And instead of taking 25 minutes to build, it takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's because I'm doing LTO. Let's even get rid of that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, it takes six seconds. So, <laughs> in terms of the build time, it is about 250 times faster. In terms of the code size, it is about five times less code. Four times less code, five times less code, uh, 1245 divided by 288, about 4.3 times. It's faster. I recognize there's one thing that they do that I do not do, which is the, um, like, uh, when it gets to a terminal case, find the quickest path. Uh, but we can totally do that. Um, this is ultimately my issue. You shouldn't have gone to assembly. You end when you go to assembly. You pretty much always end up locking yourself in a situation where you can no longer modify and improve what you have. And I realize that this output sucks, but that's the same depth that they have. Uh, if I go to depth sixteen, let's see what we get. Probably get better HTML at this depth. Do do do. Uh, 329, 329, okay, let's see. There's a good chance that maybe they crush us here um, when we go to this depth. Average.py, let's go to 16 depth. Uh, we get completely different inputs that are a lot more complex. Um, oh, yeah, it crashed. Um, uh, okay, so maybe we have to reduce the seed. Ah, uh, it crashed. Um, reduce the seed. Ah, it crashed. Okay, uh, reduce the amount of inputs that we create. Okay, there we go. And we're outperforming it. Uh, maybe we can go to a 1,000? Remember, we're giving them a pretty big benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and we're outperforming it here, too. Um. So that's, that's the TLDR. All right, so that's pretty cool. That that just creates a standalone test.rs file. Um, it's pretty huge, but who cares? Uh, it's actually fewer lines. Uh, I guess that makes sense. Um, unsafe, and here we have like these uh, updates. Uh, copy non-overlapping, that is pointer one. Uh, new size, that. Um, but yeah, this is... Um, we can do like constant safe only bool false. Um, if this is true, then the output file we generate will not emit any unsafe, unsafe code. I'm not aware of any bugs with the unsafe code that I use, and thus this is by default set to false. Feel free to set it to true if you are concerned. Okay, safe only. Then we're gonna go down here and we're gonna say if safe only, else this safe only, boop, tab this in. Looks good, and close. Okay, so, uh, in this case, uh, we wanna go to depth as equal to eight. There we go, 1700 per second, uh, true. Uh, 
400 megs per second. So it's switching away from this is is surprisingly a huge speed up. So this is going to be a uh, representation of a grammar uh, file in a Rust structure. This allows us to use uh, Serde to serialize and deserialize the uh, JSON grammar files. Grammar. Don't see. No one saw that. Okay. Um, a strongly typed uh, wrapper around a U size, which selects uh, different fragment identifiers. Okay, and this is going to be um, strongly typed wrapper, and that's just so the fragment ID is like more obvious in code. Um, a fragment, which may a fragment, uh, which is specified by the grammar file, um, a non-terminal uh, fragment, which refers to a list of fragment, uh, fragment IDs to randomly select from for expansion. This is going to be a list of fragments of a list of fragment IDs that should be expanded in order. Uh, a terminal uh, fragment which simply should expand directly to uh, the contained uh, vector of bytes. Um, a fragment which does nothing. This is used during optimization passes to remove empty fragments. Uh, remove fragments uh, with no effect. Okay. Um, a grammar representation in Rust that is designed to be easy to work with in memory and uh, optimized for uh, code generation. Okay, all types. Cached uh, fragment identifier of the start node. We don't really need that anymore, but we'll keep it. Um, uh, create a new Rust version of a grammar, which was loaded via a uh, grammar JSON specification. Man, I can't type these today. All right, create a new grammar structure. Parse the input to create all fragment names uh, to resolve. All fragment names. Uh, make sure that there aren't duplicates of uh, fragment names. Create a new empty fragment. Add name resolution to the fragment. Um, okay, parse the input grammar. Uh, get the non-terminal fragment identifier. Um, create a vector to hold all of the uh, ex uh, all the variants possible under this non-terminal fragment uh, expressions variants. Okay. Go through all of the sub fragments. Um, uh, different options for the sub fragments. Uh, go through uh, each option in the sub fragments. If if we can resolve the name of this fragment, it is a non-terminal fragment and should. Uh, be allocated as such. Okay, convert the terminal bytes into a vector. So this is the, uh, if we can resolve the name of the fragment. So we'll put this comment inside here. Um, uh, this uh, and GG. Oops, that's not what I wanted. GQ. Yeah, what? Set text with... 79? What? G 
GQ. Okay, there we go. Um, uh, get the allocator fragments. Okay. Um, push this fragment as an option. Uh, create a new fragment of all the options. Get access to the fragment we want to um, to update based on the sub option or the based on the uh, variants variants possible variants. Overwrite the terminal definition. Uh, resolve the start node. Um, allocate a fragment identifier. Add it to the fragment list. Get that good. Optimize. Uh, optimize to remove fragments. Uh, fragments with um, deterministic uh, or with non-random effects, or uh, uh, non-random effects, or yeah, actually just non-random effects. Um, I think that's true. That looks good. Program. Uh, generate a new Rust program that can be built and will generate random, um, and will generate random inputs, uh, will generate random inputs, uh, do, 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 that looks good, and benchmark them for now. Um, okay, so construct the uh, base of the application. Uh, this is a profiling loop. Uh, yep. This is a profiling loop that is used for testing. Okay. And here we're going to uh, this is going to go through each fragment in the uh, list of fragments. Create a new function for this fragment. Uh, add depth checking to terminate on uh, depth exhaustion. Um, for non-terminal cases, pick a random variant to select and invoke that uh, fragment uh, uh, routine. Pretty straightforward. Um, process all, uh, uh, invoke, invoke all of the uh, routines, all of the expressions, routines in order. Okay, uh, construct the values, or er, append the uh, terminal value to the uh, output buffer. Um, uh, for some reason, this is faster than extend from slice, even though it does the exact same thing. Um, this was observed to be over a 4 to 5x speed up in some scenarios. Okay, uh, write out the test application. Uh, load up a grammar file. Convert the grammar file to the Rust structures. Optimize the grammar. Uh, generate a Rust application. Okay, so then up here, program is going to take a p, which is an as ref path. We're going to have to pull in use standard path path, and we'll go down here and we'll say this will generate uh, test.rs. Then here, this is going to take a path. Uh, I think just fine there. Uh, dot expect failed to create um, output Rust application. Uh, this path dot into uh, dot asref. Uh, I can't 
you can't do a format string in expects, can you? Mm, 422 asref. Not a value. 322 path. Oh, I never passed that as an argument. Okay. Uh, path p. Okay. 323. Yep. Um, uh, failed to create output rest application. That's fine. Okay, and then this is going to, that's gonna generate the application. Um, I guess we can take in the depth, because uh, that's what they take in. So, what do we wanna do here? So depth, uh, this, this is now a format string thing, so we'll do format and format uh, max depth. Uh, okay, this will now take a max depth as a u size. Whoa. Um, expected two parameters, of course. Max depth, this is going to be eight. Okay. So, and we have no assembly at all. Um,. And what's cool about that is we can use this on Android, or we can compile this for ARM, or we can compile this for any architecture that we dream of, uh, as long as uh, it can be targeted by uh, the Rust compiler, which is most things. Uh, optimize the grammar. OK. So that's going to produce that input. Clear that uh, fragment 0, generated plus equals that. Um, so main, that is just an example. Um, where that's going to do a benchmark. Uh, okay, so we can have this take some arguments. Let args is equal to a vec of string, which is standard environment args.collect. Uh, get access to the command line arguments. Okay. Um, and then we're going to do... Uh, if args.len is not equal to three, um, and that's going to take the uh, uh, print usage um, cargo run, uh, or we'll say like, uh, uh, we're going to call this f0. And uh, this is going to take the um, output uh, rust file. And it's going to take the max depth. And we'll return OK on that situation. OK. Yep, that's going to fail. And then I want to have rust generate it. So optimize the grammar. Uh, create a REST application. So this is going to be args1 and args2.parse.expect invalid digit in max depth. Okay, and this is just a reference. Okay, so I should be able to then do uh, this. Cargo run release. That's going to fail. Output REST file, test.rs. Uh, depth, that should fail with a nice pretty error. Say eight, okay. That generated the test.rs. Let's make sure that that plumbed through. Tests, rs, okay. Del test service. Okay, looks good. And then um, compile the application. So, and then this is gonna be the output binary name. Uh, this is now going to be four. This is now going to be three. We're going to compile the application. So we're going to do uh, uh, use standard uh, command, process command, process, command, uh, command, new rust c dot arg. Uh, what were we using? These were pretty good. I like this. This was solid. Um, arg-o, 
optimize the binary dot arg dash g generate debug information dot arg uh, args one um, name of the input uh, rust file dot arg uh, dash c um, optimize for the current micro architecture dot arg uh, target cpu equals native dot arg dash o um, nice oh shit it's just barely off get rid of that done uh <laughs> this is uh output file name dot arg uh args two dot spawn okay uh yep and that returns a result so we'll just do uh this i think Nice. So test.rs test eight. There we go, we got test. Del test star, I think that's safe. It is. Um, get status. Okay, looks good. Okay, so that should have produced a test that I should be able to run. Uh, test. Uh, I guess on Windows, you probably want to do test.exe. Uh, del test. Del test.exe. I feel like that didn't work that one time. Let's try this. Dir. Del test.exe. Dir. Oh, whoa. Okay, some weird stuff happened there. Oh, it's, uh, spawn. I need to join. I need to join that. It was running in the background. That would make sense. Okay, so we want to do um, uh, spawn. Did you try an interpreter first? Uh, yeah, we did, and it was uh, pretty pretty close in in performance. It was I don't remember how good it was, but it was like it was pretty fine. I mean, that's how we kind of designed our data structures to be very interpreter friendly by using uh, u sizes and like everything kind of just indexes into arrays. We didn't use any complex uh, hash maps. So we have a hash map, but we only use the hash map during the actual uh, parsing of the grammar. Uh, once it actually goes to interpret, you don't need the, the hash map or the B-tree map in this case. Um, so that kind of worked out well. Spawn, I don't want uh, thread spawn. I want uh, command spawn and result. That's a result child. And I think I just want to do wait with output just wait yeah dot wait okay and that's gonna return another result uh let status is equal to this assert that the um uh exit status dot success uh, uh failed to compile rust binary okay Uh, boop, boop, boop. That's done. So here we're going to say uh, print loaded grammar JSON. Oh, we probably should specify that uh, grammar JSON file. Uh, grammar JSON. This is going to be args one. This is now going to be five, two, four, two, three. Um. Okay, perfect. Nice. So that's going to fail because we need to say JSON. Ah, dot JSON test. I don't know why my command prompt is so broken right now. Loaded the grammar JSON. Uh, print converted uh, grammar to Rust format. Uh, or converted grammar to um, binary format. And then print 
optimized grammar. Uh, print generated Rust application. Uh, Rust source file. And then this will be print created Rust binary. So, yeah, we're kind of blocking basically on the, the Rust compiler itself. So then we can do uh, del, der, del test star safe here. So I can have this output test.exe8, test.exe. There it is. Okay. So then I can get rid of the uh, this print. I don't really need generated plus equals that, if iters is that. Um, so this is going to be like filter uh, to reduce the amount of times uh, printing occurs. Test uh, dot exe. Nice. Okay, so now I can do HTML. I guess HTML. There we go. It's building generated Rust source file. Test dot exe. Good, and let me make sure that we get nice warnings if it fails to build. Nice, and it's colorized, that is great, and it stops and it panics. Perfect. That's what I like to see. Okay, so, uh, I guess that seed kind of is ass. Um, uh, but, I mean, this is, this is fine for now. Uh, how would I get a better seed? Um, there's the RAND stuff that's built into Rust. I don't want to pull in a third-party DEP at all. Um, where is RAND at? Uh, random. Nope. RAND. Uh, yeah, I guess there's no, there's no good way to get a random number for the initial seed. So I'm just going to hard code a, a decent seed then. Hex random dot rand in zero, two to the 64 minus one. Grab this. Okay. So now it's not, now it's not something so tacky and fixed. Okay. Nice generating. Do, 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 test.exe. Yay! 1.7 gigs per second. Uh, allow unused. I think I can maybe get rid of that now. I'm curious. Some of these functions won't get used. Okay. Allow unused. Uh, cell and instant. Um, are we using cell? Yes. And we're using instant as well. Uh, generated... Uh, plus equals that, self buff clear, iterators, elapsed, get that, bytes per second, good, 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 fuzzer, okay, nice. Fuzz for Sully and Monsters Inc. Uh, Monsters Inc. is a, um, uh, like Pixar, Disney Pixar uh, animation from uh, kind of a while ago now. Um, all right, so what else? Okay. All right. Test.exe, yep. And how did that compare to this? Wait, what was this? Uh, eight depth. So at eight depth, we outperform it by like a factor of five. At, at let's go to thirty-two depth. Do do do. Okay, test out exe. Uh, Python average dot pi. So we're two hundred and eleven. They are one seventy. So we outperform that as well. Um, and let's try whistle. Let's make sure that this works on Linux.
So it should just work out of the box. 1.7 gigs a second for HTML. Okay. All right, so it's working fine on whistle. Seems to be the same. Dot slash test dot exe. And there we go, 217. It's actually faster on that. So let's set this to, um, set the depth to eight. Ah, uh, so test dot exe. Yeah, there we go, 1700 per second. Um, Woo! Fuck yeah! All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna fork this quick. Uh, a local just copy paste folder fork. Uh, git status um, del example dot bin. We're not using that. Del example dot dot bin. Uh, what else? Git status. Uh, Gvim. Del test.exe test.pb test.rs. Um, it's kind of hard to filter those. I could do an inverse uh, Rust or an inverse git ignore. So we're going to get rid of git and then git ignore. We're going to do a. Um, what do I want to do here? I want to do uh, not everything, and then I want to, or git ignore everything, and then I want to do uh, everything at the current thing, and then I want to allow uh, star.json, and I also want to allow star. Dot, I want to allow source, and I want to allow cargo.toml. I don't even care about lock. I'm not a big fan of lock files. And then git ignore. Uh, git status, git init, git status. Um, and we have source and those. Git add star, git status. Sweet. OK, so then if we run it, this will end up. Um, Okay, we shouldn't have any git stuff. Good, that's what I like to see. Um, I like really strict git ignores. So ignore everything by default, only allow the JSON things, cargo toml, um, git ignore. HTML.json, let's convert this. Uh, let's anything that ends uh, there, I think I can turn into a new line. Uh, this, okay, and we'll put this on a new line. Actually, what is the, what is the Python way of uh, pretty printing JSON? Uh, Python pretty format JSON. Uh, there's like a dash M that you can do, uh, json.tool, Python 3, okay. Python 3, M, json.tool. We're gonna input the html.json. That's a bit extreme. Um, I guess this is probably fine. I wanna put this on a new line. Uh, percent s anything that is uh, space this from a dollar sign or from a carrot I want to replace with a one two three four this and that uses an actual tab is JSON supposed to use tabs okay so this one's formatted in a better way and then we have the original json.json, which is in good shape. Um, okay. JSON can use tabs. Okay. Dumps in the. Okay, yeah. 
Um, what are you writing? Are you optimizing an assembly? Nope, we're just outputting Rust. Uh, so nothing is tied to assembly. Nothing is tied to an architecture. As long as Rust can target it, we can build it. Um, Test.exe. Nice. And that was 32. 8 is the fast one. Test.exe. Beautiful. Okay. Um, let's rename this folder. So let's close this shit out. Go back a directory. Uh, rename this to um, f0fuzz. And we probably have it open in like a million places. Uh, try again. Okay, here we go. Uh, cargo toml, f0 fuzz. We will, um, I guess we'll just call it f0 here. And then we'll get rid of the lock file, cd f0 fuzz, cargo clean, dir, get init, get status, get add star, get status, get commit, and initial commits cargo run and that's an example right there okay just gonna make sure it builds no warnings no errors should be good um all right and okay and they had one other html they had a css one let me find that. Um, Vim CSS, CSS I ipen b. Um, wait, what? Is that it? Oh. Python notebook? How do you open a Python notebook file? <laughs> okay. Uh, gvim readme.md. Uh, uh, intro. Uh, f, uh, f0 is a fuzzer. Um, is a grammar based fuzzer that generates a Rust application uh, using no assembly uh, set uh, uh, text with uh, 79 um, using no uh, is a grammar based fuzzer that generates a Rust application inspired by ins inspired by the paper um, here, the paper, uh, do, 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 uh, inspired by the paper building fast fuzzers by uh, Rahul Gopinath and Andreas Zeller, uh, Z L L A R, uh, E R. Okay, uh, this. Um, F0 is a grammar based fuzzer. Um, usage currently, this only generates uh, an application that can that does benchmarking, but with some quick hacks, you could easily get the input out and feed it to an application. There is no, um, Example usage. Uh, this, this, and we'll do this. Okay. Boop. There we go. Okay. Concept. This uh, program takes in an input grammar specified by a JSON file. This uh, JSON grammar represent representation is converted to a binary style uh, rep uh, grammar 
that is intended for um, interpretation uh, and optimization. This grammar is then a, a Rust application source file is produced uh, by the shape of the input grammar. This then is compiled using Rust C to a uh, an application for the local machine. Um, this uh, doesn't have any constraints on the random number generation as it uses an infinite supply of random numbers. There is no limitation on the output size and the buffer will dynamically grow as the input is created. Uh, performance. Both the code generation phase, um, uh, uh, code generation. The performance of this tool is separated into multiple categories. One is the uh, code generation side, how long, comma, how long it takes for the uh, JSON to be compiled into a Rust application, and and uh, the other is the um, code execution speeds, which is how fast the uh, produced application can uh, generate uh, inputs. Okay, so code generation. Uh, code generation vastly outperforms the uh, building fast fuzzers paper. For example, when building, uh, for example, when uh, generating the um, for example, when generating the inputs, or when generating the uh, code based on the HTML.json uh, grammar, the F1 fuzzer took over 25 minutes to produce the code. Uh, this fuzzer is capable of uh, producing a Rust application in under 10 seconds. Okay, uh, code execution. This project is uh, on some performance metrics about 20 to 30 percent slower than the um, F1 fuzzer, but these uh, scenarios are rare. However, in some situations, in, I'll say in most situations, uh, we've been able to outperform F1 by about 30 to 50 percent. And in extreme cases, HTML depth equals eight. Uh, uh, ba -ba -ba. We've observed over a 5x or 4x speed up. We'll just downgrade that. Okay. Um, concept, example usage, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Nice. Looks good. New line. New line. Uh, let me make sure I have these. I'm just going to copy pasta these to make sure I don't typo the names because that's rude. Um, okay. Here we go. Uh, what's going on here? Where's my syntax highlighting? Why is it kind of borked here? Uh, code? Do I have code? I think I do. Uh, read me. Nice. This will give us um, fuzzer, fuzzer, fuzzers. Good. We actually made no typos in there. Oh, we did right at the very start. Wow. 
inspired. Okay. Add the URL to the sources. What do you mean by that? Okay, concept, blah, blah, blah. REST application is that. Um, okay. So, load file, close that, git status, gvim git ignore, allow readme.md, git status, git add star, git status, git commit, m added readme, Get status. I like get status a lot. Um, oh, add one to the F1 GitHub. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you can find the F1 fuzzer here. Uh, F1 uh, fuzzer GitHub. Um, PyPy, uh, pi, that then references uh, here, GitHub. Okay, nice, here we go. You can find the F1 fuzzer here. Um, uh, differences, uh, differences from the F1 fuzzer. The F1 fuzzer mentions a tech that will resolve um, resolve to the nearest uh, terminal um, resolve to the nearest terminal like tokens or we gonna say tokens um, uh, set TW79 uh, set res will resolve to the nearest terminal tokens when stack depth is exceeded. We haven't implemented this technique, but I don't think it's a huge impact on the uh, on the output uh, on the generated inputs on the generated inputs. Um, this is something I will look into in the future. Okay, uh, git status, git commit, am added some links, added difference section. Okay, uh, new repo, this F0 fuzzer, a fast Rust based safe and thread friendly <laughs> uh, grammar based uh, Generator, fuzz generator. Okay, create repo. Okay, and we just gotta do this. And we're good. All right, there it is. Okay. All right. Uh, I can find the F1 fuzzer here. Yep. Um. Okay. Um. Okay. Read me. Uh, due to not using globals, this uh, can easily be scaled out to multiple threads as the input, uh, whoops, set text width 79, as um, all uh, random seeds and, well, all random state and uh, input generation are done in a uh, structure. Okay, um, that's another difference. And then what else? Uh, there is no use of, uh, assembly in this project, and thus it can produce highly performance fuzzers for any architecture or environment that Rust can compile for. Uh, pretty much identical 
to LVM's target list. Okay. Um, highly performant uh, fuzzers for any architecture or environment that Rust can compile uh, can compile against. Uh, okay. Um, we'll put another section here. Uh, unsafe code. Unsafe code. This project uses a small amount of unsafe code to uh, provide the same semantics of extend from slice, but in a much faster way, over 4x faster. Not quite sure why it's much faster, but if you are uncomfortable with unsafe code, feel free to set uh, Uh, feel free to set safe only to true at the top of source lib.rs. Uh, this will uh, restrict this fuzzer to only generate safe code. I don't think this is necessary, but who knows? Smiley face. Uh, git commit m updated read me git push all right sweet so i'm going to start getting ready for bed um i'm probably going to make a table of all the optimization differences kind of between the f0 fuzzer or the f1 fuzzer and this f0 fuzzer so i can have like a table of how they kind of compare in performance. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. First of all, I want to say a good shout out to that F1 fuzzer. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for, for that paper. Um, I still think the claims are bold. I think that a lot of the way that it was architected was overly complex, um, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, so this is my take on how I would write like a grammar-based thing using exactly the same input model as what they use. Um, if I were to actually write a grammar-based, uh, if I were to actually write a generation-based fuzzer, I wouldn't even go really with this approach uh, where I use a grammar file. Um, but hey, um, I I wanted to see kind of how I could compare. It looks like we're basically. Uh, in the same ballpark as them for almost every single benchmark. Uh, we are much more flexible with our targeting. We can target any architecture. We don't use assembly. Our code will get better as the Rust compiler improves. It won't be stagnant based on the updating of the assembly itself. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that stream, and I'll probably be doing more uh, paper reviews in the future. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See you around.